Testing, there. testing. Okay. That's pretty loud. Testing. Okay. We'll keep it all the way down here. So for those of you that are here on campus, we're going to start at about uh, 8.35. We'll do it by that clock up there at 8.35. So if you want to run and get a bottle of water or uh, make a facility stop, this is a good time to do that.
Well, good morning. Can everybody hear me good? Can you hear me back here? Can you hear me back over on that side? Okay. So, uh, my name is Tony Dedman. I'm going to be here with you for most of the day. We're going to try to be done today by about 2.30, so just understand that we're going to be here for a little bit of time. And over the course of that time, there's some administrative things we probably need to get out of the way. There are people that are going to be uh, virtually attending this class. And so one of the things I'd like you to do is if you want to address the group or ask me a question, that we're going to have a microphone back there and a couple microphones up here. So if you can go to a microphone so that the folks on the phone or online can uh, actually hear what your question is as well. I, I may repeat it, but sometimes I forget. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just make sure that we do that. Um, the other thing is, is that we're going to take a break at lunchtime at about 1145 until 1 o'clock. Uh, the bathrooms are actually located straight back down this hall. They're there on the left as you kind of head back out toward the, the front desk there. Um, and I hope everybody had a chance to sign in because if you don't, then you won't get credit for the six CLPs, continuing learning points that you'll get for this class. Okay, so we want to make sure everybody gets credit for the class, A. Eh? Uh, the class itself is on the small business uh, things that we go through for both contracting, program management, and what generally I call acquisition. So I, I consider this to be a small business administration kind of class, but it really is a class that we're going to talk about small business from the perspective of acquisition. Okay, this is their, us using them, them using us, how we can make each other better. We have a lot of uh, initiatives that I'm going to go over as we go through the day. Uh, and some of those initiatives actually involve us trying to make sure that we're using small businesses and being more proactive in using small business uh, with that kind of being the lifeblood of what it is that we do. So the things that we're going to talk about today include, oh, that's right, you gave me a pointer here. I should probably use that. So we're going to go through and do some introductions so you know who I am and who my cohort is down there. And it looks like a small enough class that we may actually have you kind of introduce yourself and tell, tell me and him kind of who you are and what it is that you do for HHS, okay? So when we get around to that in just a moment, we'll go through that. We're going to go through what the mission is for HHS. We'll talk a little bit about money. Uh, I like to do a, a whole discussion on FAR Part 1, so we're going to do that during the first hour. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the Small Business Administration. We're going to talk about how HHS, and hopefully if Anita shows up, if Anita Allen comes and she's your small business point of contact here, uh, if she comes, then we're going to also talk about how CMS is actually doing as far as the small business scorecard. Uh, we're going to talk about some initiatives, market research, which I think is pretty important, especially when it comes to making sure that we're being totally inclusive. And then we're going to talk about some specific things, a partnership agreement, what a set-aside is, the mentor-protege programs, what these NAICS codes are, so that you guys will fully understand that, and then the rest of this you can kind of read, subcontracting plan, all the way down to how vendors should be communicating with us and how we, as the government, even though I'm a contractor, <laughs> should be communicating with, uh, with the vendors, okay? So just understand that those are the kind of things that we're going to talk about today. You're going to learn some things from me. You're going to learn a few things from the slides. And I hope that we're going to learn a few things from you, okay? So I'd like for you to, to be participatory and don't be afraid to ask a question or to make a correction if there's something that I say that's wrong. Or even more importantly, just if there's something that you think can add value to this discussion, don't hesitate to include that in this discussion, okay? So any questions on that? So let's get started. Question. Nope. Oh. So once again, you have to go to a mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just didn't see the slides on the website. Are the slides going to be made available at some uh, point? So we should have had those sent out to you. I sent them to our point of contact. Uh, let me, can you check with? Oh, yeah, uh, as long as they're available somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. So that's a good question. And that's the kind of thing I mean. Don't be afraid to, to kind of step up and ask the question. So who did not get a set of slides? Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, maybe we can have someone reproduce some slides and give them to you. I mean, there are not that many. Let me go through and introduce myself since Walt's out of the room. Uh, so I'm Tony Dedman. I'm the guy on the bottom of the chart here. And um, 
I spent 23 years on active duty. Uh, I was in the Army. I started out in armor, which is more um, tanks. I went into aviation where I flew helicopters for about 10 or 12 years. And then I finally got into acquisition, which is what I'm still doing now all these years later. So I went from, uh, from being a program manager in the government for a fairly substantial uh, R&D program that turned into a procurement program. And then I became, when I retired, I became a program manager for a major uh, defense contractor uh, and had a, a classified program that I was the program manager for with them. So I've been in acquisition for about 30 years now. So all that means is that I'm old. <laughs> but it also means that I've got a, a lot of uh, experience and expertise that I can hopefully impart and share with you as we go through the day. Uh, Walt, would you like to introduce yourself? We are getting a half a dozen slides made up, so if somebody else needs a yeah, lap, how many pop, hands would, copy. Ask them to raise their hands again. So we need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Why don't you just ask her to make twenty copies? All right. Let me see if she shot off yet. Yeah. All right. So I'll talk as I go out there and introduce myself. <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> Have this disembodied this voice. Is doc yeah, this is Dr. Walt Laney, but I go by Walt because I had a, a dad who was an electrician. He said, Walt, you get a big head, pour a glass of water, stick your finger in it, and look at the impression you just left behind. So he's a good man. So I don't let my head get too swelled. It's Walt. Um, I have 40 years, but uh, I'm in a contracting officer mode. So I'm that contingent of 1102s that works with the PMs, program managers, project officers, the cores, and trying to get what you need. Not what you want, but what you need, and help define that for you and so forth. So I started under the Armed Services Procurement Regulation with the Navy. Most of my contracting background has been with DOD, though I did spend a year at Treasury as a procurement analyst and a year at Coast Guard as a procurement analyst. And then I headed up Mid-Atlantic Region Resource Manager of Defense Contract Audit Agency. So I stepped out of 1102, went into 341, and managed the Mid-Atlantic Region. I am a 32 plus year veteran of the United States Navy. I retired as a commander, and I was an 1102, only they called them 1480, Naval Officer Billet Codes, like MOSs would be in the enlisted rank. So whether I was in a uniform in Iraq or whether I was out of a uniform in the States, I pretty much did 1102 work. In my other life, I have done PM work as a project officer for a Title II grant at Rowan University, which is in the town where I live in beautiful downtown Glassboro, New Jersey. So <clears throat> I graduated from Glassboro State, went to Central Michigan, and got my PhD out of Walden after Temple let me go three quarters of the way through and dropped the program. Isn't that lovely? But I did teach at Temple in their master's program and contracting was one of the tracks that you could take in a master's of public administration. And I taught at Penn State Smeal Business School, taught acquisition and contracting and contract management. I'm DeWea Level 3, and I also have one of those CPCM, Certified Professional Contract Manager out of the National Contract Management Association. So I have a lovely wife of 46 years and eight grandkids. I had two. Those two had eight. There's something about multiplying there. <laughs> you want to give it to this gentleman in the front row so that we can just have you kind of tell me who you are and what it is that you do for uh, either CMAS or HHS. I don't know if I should stand. My name is Adam Obest. I work at the Center, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation or CMS Innovation Center. I'm a management analyst. I've been there five years. Uh, I'm, I'm a veteran as well. I just had Army drill this past weekend. All 19 right. years of service. So, thank you for your service. So my head's all, hair's all short. So thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, service. I'm, I'd rather just talk about that all day. I'm just going <laughs> to thank you. Really, I appreciate it. Um, so I am a core contract officer, representative, of course. Um, I do actually st stakeholder engagement work. But um, because I hear of all the amazing organizations out there doing great work in healthcare, 
reform, I am very interested in the small business perspective. And like I said, it, most okay. of the people that come to us are small business. So thank you so much. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Kim Lair. I work in the office communications here at CMS. I'm in the division of training where um, we train others about the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And in that division, I'm a core managing a, a contract that's going to build training and training management systems for us. So. Good. Hi, good morning. I'm Edith Alaguerra. Could you speak I'm, up just a little bit? I work at the Center for Program Integrity. Uh, I support the fraud prevention program. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mary Ann Brewer, and I'm in the Division of Payment Validation. And this is my glass class toward a core three. I've been <laughs> okay. a core for years, but um, there's always room for a lot more knowledge. Thank hey, you. You have to have 40 hours every two years, so you'll, this may be your last class before you get it, but then to maintain it, you, you need those again. Good morning. My name is Sophia Autry. I work in the clinical standards um, group, and I um, work with uh, Quinn QIOs, which is the quality improvement organizations, and also the ESRD networks. Okay. Good morning. My name is Michael Crow. I'm a former 1102 for five years and have been a 2210 procurement analyst in the Office of Information Technology for the last couple of years. Good stuff. Hi, I'm Chuck Littleton. Um, I'm an 1102, and I'm a contracting officer. Okay. Good morning. My name is Ron Thompson. I work in the Division of Payment Validation. I'm a financial management specialist, a core level three, and a FAC PM level two. All right. Good morning. Kimberly Davis, OIT, and I support CMI models. Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Mundell. I work in the Centers for Medicare, and I'm a core two for the Medicaid uh, Provider Satisfaction Surveys. Thank you. Uh, morning. My, uh, my name is John Gong from OIT. Uh, I always see that one of the IT contractors sometimes they develop SOW review proposals and take cars to for uh, my call to refresher here. Okay, that's good. Good morning. My name is Ariel Richardson. I'm a health insurance specialist at the CMS Innovation Center where I focus on um, program integrity efforts across the center. Uh, Kathy Heischel and I work for OIT and this is my last class for the core level two. Wonderful. Good morning. My name is Liz Aragona. I'm in the centers for uh, the Center for Medicaid and Chip Services. I'm a director of the Division of Budget and Acquisitions. I'm a core level three um, and a FAC PPM level one. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeffrey De La Cruz. I work at the Center for Program Integrity, and I support the Division of Recovery Audit Operations. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Lu Ping Qiu. I work for the Office of Enterprise and Data Analytics. Okay. Good morning. My name is Lenora Scott. I'm a librarian. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Mike Walton. I'm in, um, I work in Quinvig. I have a unique position. I'm actually our division's contact for all of our contracts. So I work with the cores to ensure that from start to finish, make sure their contracts are ready and I track them and make their edits to everything until they have actually been awarded. Um, I'm a core and a FAC PPM and I spent 29 years in the only true branch of the military the Air Force. Oh. <laughs> we won't hold that against you. <laughs> I'm Cheryl Caldwell. I'm with OAGM, and I'm a contract specialist. Good morning. My name is Rachel Johnson. I am with OAGM, uh, Division of Medicare Support Group, uh, contract specialist. Good morning, my name is Jessica Jaworski and I work in the Office of Communications and I oversee um, the contract that does all our surveys on our websites. Thank you. Hi, Tim Hugerworth. I work uh, in CM uh, on a da database, health and management system, and uh, this is, I'm working on my core three recertification. Okay, Anita. 
Hi, I'm Anita Allen. I'm the small business specialist that supports CMS. And you can just leave it right there if you want, or you can hold it there if you want to, because you may want to contribute as we go through some of this. So thank you, everyone. As you can see, we've got a really, really nice cross-section of folks here. And one of the things that I think is important as we go through the day is to recognize, like I said, is that you're going to learn some things from me. You're going to learn some things from the materials that we're presenting. But with the talent that we have in here, I hope that we can learn a few things from you guys as well. And so don't be afraid to contribute. I like to start every one of these conversations off with a conversation about the mission for health and human services. And the reason I like to do that is, is because everything that you buy, uh, we're in the business of spending, and a lot of you are cores and contracting officers and PM and financial managers, as you heard. We're in the business of actually trying to make sure that we're being good stewards of the government's money. The government's money also being our money since we're taxpayers, right? And so it's really important to understand that for us to do that, we have to really focus on how are the dollars that we're spending moving us closer to achieving the mission that we show up here, okay? Did you have a question back there, sir? Okay. So the mission for the Department of Health and Human Services is to enhance the health and well-being of Americans by providing for effective health and human services by fostering sound, sustained advances in the sciences, underlying medicine, public health, and social service. And then of the three or four strategic goals that we have up here, I've kind of highlighted two, because one of the things that we have to always realize is, is that the federal government always wants to be on the cutting edge the cutting edge of technology. We always want to be the front runner. We, we take positions and steps that no one else would do. This whole idea of the Affordable Care Act and all of these kind of things, these are too big for some company to try to run, and so we try to do those things ourselves. So we want to advance scientific knowledge and innovation with emphasis on innovation. We'll talk a lot about that today. We also want to ensure that we get efficiency, transparency, accountability, and effectiveness. So those are noble goals, but I think that they're all things that are achievable. And if we keep the focus on what the mission is and then what these goals are, then I think that that's something that will help us as we think of ways that we can be more inclusive with this entire kind of acquisition system that I like to talk about. So one of the things that we have to, to do this with are the dollars that are available. So you see here on this slide that it shows that we have about $1.145 billion for the entire HHS in the President's budget for 2017, okay? So that's this total outlay here is $1.1 billion, okay? So that's a pretty big number. If you think about the overall number for the whole United States government, it's about $3.7 trillion, okay? So that's the overall budget for the United States of America, is $3.7 trillion. Of that $3.7 trillion that we're talking about, and trillion, just to put this in perspective, a billion that you see here is nine zeros. A trillion is 12 zeros. So it's, you know, three orders of magnitude larger. But even more importantly, half of that money that's in that 3.7, yes, sir? This is um, billion. Yeah, you're right. So that is 1.1 trillion. You're absolutely right. So 1.1 trillion, and that, that was actually the point that I was going to make is, is that of that 3.7 trillion dollars that's in the federal budget, a great amount of that is actually set up so that it is in areas that are what we call discretionary, and then the rest of it is in things that are just absolutely on kind of autopilot. Medicare, Medicaid, or on autopilot, <laughs> Social Security, autopilot, my retired military pay, thank you guys very much, is on autopilot, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then we have disc discretionary budget, and we'll talk about that. So you can see that the discretionary programs are only about 8% of your billions of dollars that you have here for this agency, okay? Fairly substantial budget as far as outlays, okay? The other thing to keep in mind is that for CMS, the number is a little bit smaller, 751 million for kind of discretionary kind of things. 
Some of it goes for grants, some of it goes for payments to health care trust funds and for program management. But this much is really what's in discretionary, and those are the dollars that we have that we can actually put under contract in many cases. And so overall for the federal government, that number rolls up to about $500 billion of what we can put under contract. So if you're a core or a financial manager or a contracting officer or any of those things that are related to procurement, then this becomes something that's pretty important to you. So if we're going to do that, one of the things that we have to understand is, is that we have a document that is called the FAR, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulation. So I handed out a, a page to you guys. I hope everybody's got that page. Does everybody get a copy of that? Okay. And so on that is actually page 1.1-1 of the FAR. On the top of that page is just the bios from myself and Walt, but on the bottom of that is, are the guiding principles for the FAR. So let's start there. Uh, the vision for the federal acquisition system is to deliver on a timely basis the best value product or service to the customer. Now we've got a lot of acquisition types in here. When you think of best value, what does that mean for you? You can shout it out and I'll just repeat it. Best value. Best price. Best, best price. price, okay. What else? Best quality. Best quality, that would be important, right? Best mix. The best mix. Of price and best mix of price and quality. And I think all of those things work. So let me tell you what my kind of look at this is, and I like to put this into a perspective that everyone, whether you're a contracting officer or not, can understand. So I like to look at it from the standpoint of I'm having work done on my house. Someone is going to come into my house to do the work, and I want to make sure that several things are kind of in place so that that work is done to my satisfaction. Because that thing starts off with delivering on a timely basis the best value product or service to the customer, okay? So at my house, who's the customer? <laughs> Me, <laughs> okay? And for you, you need to determine who your customer is because you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're buying helps to enhance the mission and satisfies your customer. So if you turn that sheet over on the back, what I've done is given you some thoughts, my thoughts on best value. So I like to start with management. So if I'm having someone work in my house, I'll probably have a general contractor that will make sure that we get the right people with the right tools and the right skill sets to the right place at the right time. All right, that would be kind of nice to have, right? And if they're going to be working in my house, I'd like to make sure that they're, you know, going to do the work that, to my satisfaction and that when they leave, they're going to clean up after themselves. Should we expect any less of a vendor that we hire to do work for us? And the answer is no. I mean, this should be the same thing. We want to get the right people with the right tools and the right skill sets to the right place at the right time, satisfy us as customers, and leave the place like they found it, okay, so that they don't leave it in a mess or whatever. So those are all things that we would like to do. The second thing there I list is technical proficiency. Once again, going back to my home example, if I'm going to bring in a plumber or a carpenter or a baker or uh, anything, I want to make sure that they either have a skill set that's at least as good as mine, right, or if not as good as mine, I'm not going to hire them first, but the other thing is it should be at least as good as I am and they should add an extra set of hands to me, okay? When we hire vendors, we want to make sure that those vendors actually bring added value to the equation, and that's what we're looking for, okay? So that's technical proficiency, and we want to make sure that when we have vendors that show up to do work for us, that they are technically proficient. Uh, the third one here is, how many times do you think you've hired someone and this is the first time they've ever done something? And the answer is probably not as often as you would think because we tend to do things in the civilian world where we check things like Angie's List and, you know, um, if we're going to a restaurant, we'll go on to Yelp or whatever. So we use tools that allow us to try to determine if someone has adequate past performance, okay? So when we look at this tool, we have a tool that's called CPARS. You guys may have heard of that. It's the Contractor Performance Assessment Report. For those of you that are cores, you do this. At the end of a contract, at the end of a period of performance, you do a Contractor Performance Assessment Report where you mark them down as either being good, bad, or ugly, 
in several different areas, including management and technical and cost and schedule and a bunch of other things. The bottom line is, is when you give them that report card, that report card goes into a system that's called PPIRS, the Past Performance Information Retrieval System. And when it goes into that system, that gives us a three-year look at their past performance. So if that performance is good, we see it for three years. If that performance is bad, we see it for three years. The reason I like to look at past performance is it tells me, A, that they've done it before, that they should be able to do it again. Not a guarantee, but at least that gives me more confidence and it reduces my risk of failure by thinking that they can do this. But the other thing is, is by looking at it, I can tell if they had bad performance, do I want to use them again? Probably not. If they had good performance, would I love to use them again? And that's probably so. So one of the things that we do with past performance is we use that as an additional kind of screening tool to make sure that we're getting what it is that, we're, that was advertised and that we're paying for. One of the other things that comes with that, though, is the resumes. So resumes, I worked in the Pentagon for a number of years, and I would get vendors that would come in and sell me on some service or product, and I would think to myself, I'm going to buy that because they have presented such a good argument, and they are so smart, and they are really, really capable. I'm going to do this. And then when I would buy it, the people that would show up to deliver the service to me weren't the same people. They were people that didn't have the experience or didn't have the expertise or didn't have the education. Usually they had the education, but they didn't have the experience. If the person that was talking to me had 12 years, this person would come in and they would have one or three or whatever. And so the way that we can avoid that is, is by designating someone as key personnel in our contract. And that way, if they decide to not give us the people that we thought we were getting, they have to give us someone, and we get the right of first refusal, by the way, they have to give us someone that has similar education experience and, edu and uh, expertise, okay? Everybody kind of understand that? So that's, that's kind of important as well. And then finally, after I've looked at the management and the technical proficiency and the past performance and the resumes, I'm ready now to look at cost. Now I know someone over here said we want to get the best cost, right? <laughs> and so it's like you can't, you don't know if you have the best cost unless you're looking at some of these other things, okay? Now I know that you can say it's the lowest price. So we do have a thing that we call lowest price technically acceptable. Who's heard of that? So lowest price technically acceptable, if you just take your little pencils right now and put a check mark next to cost price and put a check mark next to technical proficiency, those are the two areas that you're looking at and you're not looking at management and you're not looking at resumes and you're not looking at past performance. You're only looking at technical acceptability, okay? So let's talk about technical acceptability for just one second. That doesn't say that it's technically wonderful. <laughs> it doesn't say that it's technically exceptional. What does it say? That it's technically acceptable, okay? So we get to draw that bar, and we can draw that bar higher or lower, kind of depending on who we are. But the bottom line is, is that if you went and checked to see what the lowest price was and reviewed their technical approach and it was acceptable, You've almost made your decision at that point without reviewing anything else. Now, I recognize we need to review the other proposals. We can't just look at one. But you get the idea. We could do it that quickly, and that's what we would be stuck with if we use that end of the best value continuum to make our decision. And so we have this other end with all of these things that I just talked about, which is one end of the continuum, and we have LPTA, which is at the other end of that continuum, and then everything else kind of falls in between those two. Questions on that? Okay. So let's go back over to the front side of our sheet here. Uh, so as we we're reading, it says, while maintaining the public's trust and fulfilling public policy objectives. So once again, since this is an actual class that we're supposed to be interactive, what would you consider for the federal acquisition system to be public policy objectives? Once again, if you tell me, I'll repeat it, okay? What would you consider to be public policy objectives of the federal acquisition system? Remember, I tell you, it's $500 billion that we're going to be putting out in contracts every year. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, well, just like you said at the beginning, uh, proper stewardship and uh, when you're spending taxpayer money. 
All right, so proper stewardship of, of taxpayers' dollars, and that's absolutely important. Transparency. Transparency is very important as well. Anything else? So let me go through a few. Once again, if you turn your pages over. The first one that I've listed there is um, trying to be inclusive. So in order to be inclusive, one of the things we want to do is we want to take people that have been marginalized and not part of this system and see if we can bring them into this system, okay? So we'll start with uh, a couple, two or three things here that you have on the notes here. And if you want to add some to this, you're more than welcome to. But the first one there is the National Institute of the Blind and the National Institute of the Severely Handicapped. So those are known as NISH and um, NIB. And so both of those have a, a organization that's called Ability One. You probably have heard of Ability One. And FAR Part 8 actually has this as one of our recommended sources for a lot of things that we buy. And the nice thing about this is, is by using Ability One, you're actually helping people that are blind or severely handicapped. But more importantly, if they have jobs and they're able to contribute to society and they're paying taxes and they own houses, they're in better position to feel better about themselves and less in a position that they're feeling sorry for themselves or dependent on the rest of society to take care of them, they're actually taking care of themselves. So that's why from a public policy perspective, we encourage you to use things like Unicor, okay? The second one here, I'm sorry, like Ability One. So the second one is, in fact, Unicor. So this is part of the federal prison industries. These are people, <coughs> excuse me, that are incarcerated. And they're being taught a skill. And by being taught this skill, they're actually making products or providing services. And if, if they're incarcerated and they're learning this skill, theoretically, this is the public policy side of this, when they leave prison, instead of going back to their original skill set that they had that got them incarcerated, this will give them a chance to use their new skill set to have a job and to you know, buy a house and to become a productive citizen and all those kind of things, okay? So one of the things we want to do is cut down on recidivism. So that is the actual public policy that we're trying to do with this is we're trying to make sure that we're taking advantage of that. So they have this organization, it's called Unicor, that they market their products through. And so when you see that, be sure and try to use that when you can. The other public policy objective that we have overall, and this is something that you'll see kind of throughout the FAR, is that we want to have competition. Competition actually does two things. The first thing that it does is it actually drives prices down. If I were to come to one of you with an idea and you were going to give me a proposal, it would be a very good proposal and it would be for a great price, but if you knew that I was going to someone else, <laughs> that price is coming down because you want to win that business. And that's how it works. With competition, we get those prices down. And that's one of the reasons that you'll see that everything that we do in America today, and in fact around the world today, is getting faster and smaller and better and all of those things. Look at what we've done with the cell phone. How many people think that the iPhone would be on version whatever they're on, 10 or X or whatever they call it now, right? They would be on version two probably by now. If you recall back to the days when we had those uh, big black phones on our desk, you remember those days? Uh, you guys are way too young for that, but back in the old days, <laughs> we used to have a phone on our desk that was plugged into a, a cable on the ground there, and you could only go as far as that cable would allow you to go. And when you left that and got in your car, you had no means of communication whatsoever. And when you got to where you were going, you then had to find another phone that was plugged into the ground. Fast forward now 25 years or whatever it's been, and I can promise you that when you look at the technology for these little cell phones that you can fit into your pocket, and soon they're going to probably make them so they're like credit card size <laughs> and be more capable than what we have now because they continue to get smaller, although I've seen some of these kids that have some pretty big cell phones, and apparently that's the new trend since they use it for their television and movie screen and everything else, right? But the bottom line is, is competition actually drives all of that. So the other thing, and this is something that we want to talk about for the people that are blind, for the people that are disabled, for the people that come out of prison, and even for the next categories that we're talking about, people that are in these categories tend to be totally inclusive of the other people that are in their category. When they're out looking for people to hire, 
you'll find that they hire if prisoners, they hire other prisoners because they're com comfortable hiring other people that have been incarcerated. Blind people tend to hire other people that are disabled or blind, okay? And it's just the nature of the business. So as we go through this next piece here, uh, I want you to keep that in mind. So the first category I'm going to talk about is woman-owned businesses, okay? Women make up about 53% of the population because you tend to live longer than we do. <laughs> but more importantly, you only make up something less than 5% of companies that are owned by women that do business with the federal government, okay? And we're gonna look at some numbers here in a minute and you'll see what I'm talking about, but you know, we could do a whole lot better than that, okay? And the biggest thing is that if a woman decides that she's gonna start a business, then we try to give her and her company a little bit of an advantage. We'll either set aside work for her and her company, excuse me, or we will make it so that a large business will set aside a portion of whatever we give them for her business, okay? And so what we're trying to do is give them a running start so that for the first six or seven years that they're in business, we give them an increased probability of success, okay? That's really what the goal is. And by doing that, we're hoping to bring that 5% number up to 10. You know, let's start small. <laughs> I'd like to bring it to 53%, but let's get to 10 first, and then we can rejoice. And when we get to 20, we can have a big party, and you get the idea. But let's get it to, you know, let's get the five locked in, and then let's get to 10. And so in some cases, we don't make those goals. Here, we do happen to be making it, it appears, but we'll get to that slide in a moment. The second category under this small business, though, is, is minority-owned business. You've heard of that called 8A. And what that is are African American, Aleutian American, Hispanic American, a bunch of other hyphenated Americans that fit into the category of minority owned businesses. And by doing that, once again, we're going to give them this head start. We're going to help them. We're going to give them as many advantages as we can so that they can be successful. A lot of businesses, as you may recall, or if you actually pay attention, you will see that a lot of businesses don't actually last for more than two years and they go out of business. Three years, they're out of business. How many times have you gone to a really, really nice restaurant and you had to wait in line or they tell you, sir, there's an hour and a half waiting list, you know, and you get there and you go, wow, this place is banging. This is really good food. It's really popular. Everything is great. And then you go back with your friends the next time and it's closed. And you go, what the heck happened? And so what happened is, is that they didn't know how to run a business. And so one of the things that we do with all of these small businesses is we try to help them to be successful. We try to increase their probability of success. And we'll talk about some of those things as we go along here today where we try to link them up with a large business. We put them into a mentor-protege program. We give them a lot of skill sets that hopefully will make it so that they're able to compete. And then when they graduate from this program, then they'll be able to stand on their own two legs and be able to compete against anybody because they've got that background and experience and expertise behind them, okay? And so that's what we're trying to do when we look at these small businesses. The third category of small business is veteran-owned small business. Now, there's a subset of this that we call SDV OSB, okay? So that's Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business. So a veteran-owned small business is someone that served in the military, like many of you have done, as you've kind of told us here this morning, and you decide to start a business. If you decide to start a business, then we're gonna give you that same advantage that we gave to the women and to the minorities. We're gonna give you the opportunity since you served to do this. And if you were disabled, we're gonna give you even more opportunity to be successful by helping you even a bit more. And so I actually experienced this, not that I'm a service disabled veteran, but I actually went out to help a service disabled veteran owned company that was out in uh, the Seattle, Washington area, which is where I'm from. And out there, I went to this company, the entire company is made up of disabled veterans. I told you that disabled veterans tend to hire disabled veterans, veterans tend to hire veterans, etc. cetera. Uh, but this entire company consisted of people that were missing limbs, arms and legs and had all kinds of injuries, but they were so happy to be working that these folks, and they had this small, uh, small vehicle repair business, which was for the Army, or like, I guess it was prim primarily the Army, but they fixed all of the Army's uh, Humvees and all of their small vehicles and generators and all that kind of stuff, 
changing tires, pulling engines out, doing all kinds of stuff, and you just looked at it and went, wow, this is just absolutely amazing. And I talked to this one person who was missing an arm, and he said, I am so stoked that I get an opportunity to do this because I'm very capable, but most people wouldn't give me this chance. And so since I have this chance, I'm not going to blow it. And so they're working, they're doing things. I mean, it was the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. But that's what you get when you give people an opportunity. And so if we can give people opportunities, then we're not also then having to give them some kind of subsistence so that they can survive. Uh, in this case, since they work for a company, they've got health insurance, you know, they have a pension plan to go with whatever they got from the military, and they're in a position where they can raise a family and have, you know, all of those productive things. So from a public policy perspective, can you kind of understand why it's important for us to try to help them? So let's keep those things in mind. And then the last area is this historically underutilized business zone. Now you've heard of this called a hub zone. So a hub zone is actually uh, where someone takes a risk and puts a business into an area that has never been a great place to put businesses, okay? And we've seen this, um, you've seen it here in Baltimore, out here by where the, the, um, the football stadium and the baseball stadium are and where the Inner Harbor is now. See, I've been in this area, I told you, I came, well, I didn't tell you, but I came back here in like 1985 when they were just starting to think about building up the Inner Harbor, and that was not a great place to be in, okay? It was, they actually had row houses that they were selling for a dollar that you could buy the entire building for one dollar, but you had to live in it for a year. How many people think you could buy one of those houses down there along the Inner Harbor for a dollar? Okay, so you guys are all laughing, but I'm telling you, at that point, you could do that because no one wanted to live there. But once they put those ballparks in and someone took a chance, then businesses started growing there. And all of a sudden, that inner harbor is a highly desirable place. Those houses are not even probably affordable for most of us, okay? And the, point of, and the whole point of fact is, is that if someone takes that risk and puts a business into those areas, what that does for the people that live in that area, if they're not forced out by gentrification, <laughs> but if, if what that does for people that live in that area is instead of having to take, you know, two trains or a bus and an Uber to get to a job interview, they can walk. And when they want to have lunch with their child, they can walk home, have lunch, and go back to work and not have to worry about it. So from that perspective, it helps to make them into a... It reduces crime by putting a business into those areas because as people get jobs, they don't need to go out and steal. So that's kind of nice, right? It also puts us into a, into a position where we're creating an entire environment where everything improves. Where I live uh, in, in Rockville, I actually work down in Washington, D.C., and they put Nationals Park into a, a neighborhood that was really, really kind of unacceptable. And that neighborhood, since they put that ballpark there, has now come up to the point where some of the most desirable homes are there. I park my car to go to a baseball game, and I see people jogging and playing tennis and pushing baby strollers. And I'm thinking to myself, I used to drive through this area at 40 miles an hour and not even stop for stop signs. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was too dangerous for me to feel comfortable even stopping. So. The fact that they took that risk and put that ballpark there has really turned that entire area around. So the crime has gone almost to, I hate to say zero, but it's gone way, way down. And the home values have gone up. The schools that are in that vicinity, because they have more demanding parents, have really increased their ability to educate the kids. And so everything, just kind of from a public policy standpoint, that's one of the reasons that we want to try to do hub zones. Now hub zones are tough and we're going to give you some criteria for what you have to have when you do a hub zone because you have to find, you know, a workforce to do the work in that hub zone that 35 percent of the people actually come from that hub zone. So it's not an easy statistic to meet, but we're going to see what we can do to help you to meet that, that criteria, okay? So any questions on kind of some of these things that are public policy objectives of the federal acquisition system? Okay, so let's keep reading. So we're now down to um, participants in the acquisition process. Should work together as a team and should be empowered to make decisions within their areas of responsibility. 
So let's, you know, the next paragraph there is the team itself. That team consists of all participants in government acquisition. Now I noticed that some of you were introducing yourselves. You didn't think that what you were saying actually made it so that you were included in that acquisition team, but you are. If you're a financial manager, you're part of that team. If you're a core, you're part of that team. If you're a contracting officer, you're part of that team. If you're a PM, you're part of that team, okay? So that team consists of all participants in government acquisition, including representatives of the technical, we've talked about the technical, supply, that's logistics, procurement, that's everyone that I just listed. You're all part of that procurement community. You're the ones that are actually spending the money. If you got a government purchase card, you're part of that whole procurement community, okay? But also the customers they serve. Remember when I had that contractor come in and do work on my house? and I wanted them to make sure that they did the work to my satisfaction. The reason that I say that is because I'm the customer. I want them to satisfy me. Your customer wants you to satisfy him or her or them or whoever, okay? And so that becomes something that's really, really important. Yes, ma'am. I just want to mention that you also want to include the small business specialists as part of the acquisition planning team. Um, if you include me early, it helps from me slowing down a procurement later on when I don't necessarily like the direction you may be going as far as whether you're setting it aside or not. So it's always best to include me early in the planning. That's a very good point. And the reason that that's such a good point is, is that we have to explore all of the possibilities. So when we look for competition, we can look for competition amongst everyone or we can narrow this down to where we're only going to compete this amongst small businesses and sometimes only amongst minority-owned small business or amongst woman-owned small business or whatever it is so that we can meet some of the goals that we have. And so we'll talk about those goals here in a bit. The other thing is, is that it includes the contractors who provide those products or services. The reason that we do that is not because I'm a contractor, which I am, and I saw that we may have one other contractor here, so I'm happy to be, also have another contractor in the room. But more importantly, the reason we have to include contractors is because you guys that are federal employees are heads down working on all of the things that are important to you. And you are working at lunch and you're working when you get home and you work sometimes on, you're working on your way to work, okay, <laughs> with cell phones and all those kind of things. You are heads down working. What you don't know is, is that those vendors that are out there, they're also heads down, but they're heads down trying to be competitive because they're looking for a, com a competitive advantage they're looking for things that they can turn into intellectual property. They're looking for things they can turn into patents. They're looking for anything that's going to allow them to last for more than that first two or three years. So when you see companies that have been around for 10 years and 15 and 30 and whatever years, they have continued to kind of reinvent themselves. Look at Apple. Apple started out in one direction. They've kind of stayed in that direction, but they have continued to reinvent themselves as they come along, okay? And that's what's important. But would they even be close to where they are now if we didn't have Samsung? <laughs> That's that competition that forces the prices and the innovation that we talked about, okay? So any questions on kind of the guiding principles of the federal acquisition system? So we have one more thing I want to talk about with this is, and that is the role of each member of this team. So you'll notice that I have two words there, actually six words or so, but let's go through them exercise personal initiative. What that means is, is that part of this federal acquisition system is, is that we encourage you to not wait for someone to tell you what to do. Remember when we talked about those vendors having experience and education and expertise? Well, I have good news for you. All of you have all of those things too. So we want you to use that experience and education and expertise to come up with using your personal initiative and your sound business judgment within your area of expertise, okay? And that's what's important to us as far as the guiding principles of this federal acquisition system, okay? So I promised you a break about every hour. It's about 9.24 now. We're pretend it's 9.25. We're gonna take a break until 9.35 and come back in ready to start again. It's very important for you to be back here on time, ready to start again at 9.35. By that clock in the back of the room.
Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Do they still have one? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. Um, Crystal. Handouts too, as well, please. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started back. Um, when we last spoke, we were talking about FAR Part 1. There was one thing that I didn't actually get to, and that's this part down here that says government members of that team may assume that if a specific strategy, practice, policy, or procedure is in the best interest of the government and is not addressed in the FAR or prohibited by law, blah, blah, blah that that strategy, practice, policy, or procedure is a permissible exercise of authority. So all that says is, is that back here when we talked about exercise and personal initiative and sound business judgment, that if you do those things and for whatever reason everything doesn't go as well as you thought it was, we're going to give you some latitude to make a mistake. Because when we're trying to be aggressively seeking innovation, then in the process of doing that, if something does hiccup, we don't want that to be the end of you and your career and all those kind of things. So be sure that you know that that's there. A lot of times people don't point that out to you, but what we're seeing there is, is that if, you're, if you use that sound business judgment and exercise that personal initiative, that we're going to give you some benefit of the doubt just in case something does not go as well as it could. Let's talk about uh, the Small Business Administration. So the mission of the SBA is, as you see there, it is to aid, counsel, assist, and protect the interests of small business concerns. They want to preserve free competition and free competitive enterprises, and they want to maintain and strengthen the overall economy of the nation. The thing that I've noticed in my thousand years that I've been here on the planet is that every president always says small business is the backbone of the country. And all you have to do is drive down, you know, Route 40 or Route 1 or any of these different routes in, in, uh, on the East Coast here, and you look at all of those businesses that have five employees, seven employees, the laundromats, the restaurants, the whatever, those are all small businesses, okay? I know we, we kind of focus on the Googles and how much they're making and the Amazons and how much they're making and, you know, Home Depot is taking over all of the local, you know, hardware stores or whatever. But the bottom line is, is that the greatest majority of people in this country actually work for a small business, okay? So when we look at small business, it really is important to keep in mind that we're trying to strengthen the overall economy of the nation by helping as many of those small businesses, especially in those categories that I spoke about before, if we can help them to be successful and to contribute to the government with the four five hundred billion dollars that we're spending, then let's do that. And that's the reason we talked about those public policy objectives. So this last bullet here kind of addresses what I've said and you'll just have it there that you can have as a takeaway is that Overall, the U.S. government is the single largest purchaser of goods and services in the world. $500 billion worth of goods and services is a huge, huge number, okay? And with that number, then we've got to try to do some things that can help us to get to some of those uh, public policy objectives that we talked about. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, primarily from the standpoint that we have a Small Business Administration Office of Government Contracting and Business Development. And what they do is they work with agencies to award their goal, overall goal, of that $500 billion. We want to award 23% to small business. Now, we have some goals that we're going to go over for HHS and uh, maybe even for CMS. But the bottom line is, is that when we look at that, we want to look at the goals that they have for small disadvantaged businesses, woman-owned small business, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, and small businesses that are in hub zones, okay? So all those things that I talked about, those are actually goals that we have set aside, not wrong term because that means something, that we have goals that are actually 
uh, put into agencies that they will try to meet. In addition, they have this business development program. And what that does is it takes these 8A programs specifically in developing and growing their businesses through one-on-one -on -one counseling. They have training workshops. They try to match them with a mentor protege. I actually have one of these. I'm, I'm a large business, not me, but my company is a large business. And we work in conjunction with the small business. And that small business is responsible for all of the logistics. They do all of the, uh, when we teach classes, they make the books. They arrange for the classroom. They make sure the students get their certificates and all of those kind of things. And we actually teach the classes. And so by working with them, with us being a large business and them being an 8A small business, do you think we're going to let them fail? No, because their failure is our failure, right? Do you think that this is good for them to have a business that's been in business for a period of time to help them? Yes, okay, so when we get to the part of this discussion where we talk about mentor-protege, even if we don't call it a mentor-protege program, it is when we try to do those kind of things, okay? We try to hook them up with someone that can help them decrease their risk of failure and increase their probability of success, and that's what we're looking for. In addition to that, we also give them matchmaking opportunities with federal buyers. So what, what that program is designed to do is to link them up with agencies like yours so that if you have opportunities that are there and you have goals that you're trying to meet, if we link them with you, A, it helps you meet your goal, but B, it helps them get the business that they need in order to become viable as a business. So it's, it's actually a pretty good thing. So let's look at some of these numbers. So the overall numbers, and some of these are in red and some are in green. I think one of them at least I probably should have put in green, but it's not. So let's just go through these kind of quickly. And I will use my handy dandy pointer that my partner in crime here has given me. So let's look first of all at overall small business. Remember I said that we were trying for 23% overall as kind of the goal for the entire federal government. For HHS, their goal in 2016 was 22.75 and they actually exceeded that. So that 23 point whatever included having $5.4 billion that went into small business. So that's a pretty big chunk. That's a nice number. It exceeded the goal. We are ecstatic that you have an organization this large that's got a budget of that size that actually met that goal. So that is kudos to you, kudos to Anita, <laughs> but kudos to you and all of the small business people that are working within this entire agency. When it came to woman-owned businesses, once again, kudos. Notice the goal was 5% and you got 7.29%. It's a little bit down from 2015, but it still exceeded the 5%, so that is actually wonderful as well, right? Third, small disadvantaged businesses overall. The goal was 5%. You doubled that, $2.6 billion, kudos. So where do you think that we're gonna have to actually tell you that you came up a little bit short? I'm a veteran, do you think this makes me happy? No, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so for service disabled, veteran owned small businesses, the goal was 3% and we only got it to 1.56%. So one of the things that we had as a question the last time was how does a company get to be a service disabled small business and how would we know that they were actually service disabled in a small business? So I think Anita, the last time you said that they have to self-certify, would you like to discuss that? Service disabled veteran owned small businesses in civilian agencies self-certify. If they do business with DOD or the VA, they have to go through that formal process of the VA being determined by the VA that they are in fact service disabled. But at this point in time, um, they, these companies can self-certify with civilian agencies. We do recommend that they do go through the formal process, but it is not mandatory for them to do so. And when they do go through the formal process, they're actually posted on the VA's Vet Biz website that shows that they have gone through the uh, process and have that certification. All right. So the Veterans Affairs, the Department of Veterans Affairs maintains a list of all of the ones that have gone through their process to be certified, but to actually do business with civilian 
agencies, they can actually, companies can actually self-certify, okay? And so there is a little bit of concern with that in that, you know, they may not be quite as uh, forthcoming or take themselves out of the program at the time that they should. Yes, ma'am. While you're on this slide, do you want me to give you CMS's goal achievement? Oh, good. I don't have that. So, yes. And I can actually add that to what we send out as an after-course reminder. I don't have today's report yet. It's being run. But as of last Monday, um, the CMS uh, goal is 16%. Um, the actual achievement as of last Monday was 18.9. The small disadvantaged business goal is 5%. Uh, CMS's uh, goal achievement was 9.28%. The woman owned small business goal is 5%. And as of last Monday, um, it is 5.87. That's a concern because it has dropped since last year. So we're really concerned that that might drop below the 5%. The hub zone goal and the service disabled goal are both 3%. The hub zone, as of last Monday, we were at 0.48%, not even at a half percent. The service disabled veteran owned small business goal actually dropped from the week before. It was 1.25. It is now dropped to 0 0.60 because as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year and people have money um, to spend, that money wasn't necessarily planned previously. So it's throwing off the, the numbers. And in fact, I'm even concerned that we may not achieve the small business goal this year for CMS. So if you have any last minute buys, if you can direct them towards small business, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, so one of the things some agencies do is they have these list of unfunded requirements, and I don't know if you guys do that here. Uh, I'm over in Homeland Security, that's kind of my day job is working over with FEMA. And what they've done is, is they have a list of all of the funded requirements that they had money for and they did. But as you know, by the time you get to June, July, August, and even though we didn't get our money until May, uh, they've identified people that can't get their money under contract by September 30th. And they've identified other people that could, but they're on the unfunded list. And so they're trying to move people from the unfunded list to the funded list and moving people from the funded list that couldn't spend their money to the, to the unfunded still requirements list. Yes, sir. Can I get you to go to a microphone? How, so the question is, is how is the 16% spread across the agency? Well, it looks like what, what Anita just said is that the agency goal is 16%, but the small uh, disabled business goal is 5%. The woman-owned small business goal is 5%. You're talking with CMS, like the different program offices. And I don't have that kind of a breakdown. Um, I think the contract shop can run that kind of a breakdown, but I don't have access to that kind of data. CMS may be able to run it through their CAM system. So the question is, is there a particular type of business that earns more small business kind of work, it sounds like? Is, was that the question? You mean the types CMS. of services in the IT arena? That's the hugest. And any kind of consulting services, you have a lot of small businesses that can do that where it, the numbers are all set at CMS is on your um, um, MAC contracts or your UPIC contracts or your um, QIO contracts. That's where there's a lot of money that goes there that offsets it to, and draws down on the small business dollars. That's why it's important to look at the, uh, the areas that small businesses can do, look at breaking procurements apart when they can. In fact, uh, CCSQ, if anybody's in here from CCSQ, um, they have actually taken some of their big IT requirements and split them up. And companies like Northrop Grumman, CSRA, and some others where they thought it was going to go unrestricted, the, these are now going small business. Okay, thank you. Great questions. I like that. Any other questions? Because one of the things that we look at is that these are the goals for when they're prime. We also have goals for when they're actually in a kind of a subcontracting environment. This is where you have a large business 
that we ask them to set aside a portion of their work for small business so that they can help us meet these goals as well, okay? So we set up goals for that, not me, but your agency set up goals for that. And so the goal for overall small business that are in the subcontracting achievement area, even though it was 22% up here, this is a big number, okay? In DOD, where I spent the majority of my life, <laughs> it was about 30%, which I thought was huge. Yours is 33%, which is, that's just phenomenal. And the good news is, is that you came really, really close to achieving that, and that's the nice thing about setting a high goal, because you see how much higher that number is than this one? So that's a good thing. The second thing is, is for woman-owned small businesses, once again, you're green, which is great. Uh, for small disadvantaged businesses, the goal is 5%, and you're at 5.4%. And then for the service disabled, and once again, the hub zones, and hub zones are hard to get, I understand that. And we talked about that. This is, there's a requirement that 35% or 33% of the people that work in that company in a hub zone have to be from that hub zone, <laughs> okay? They can get, you know, 65% from somewhere else, but 35% of the folks have to live in that hub zone. That's a big number especially if you're talking about something that's technical or something, you know, whatever the, the, the business itself is, in some cases it's hard to get people with that education expertise and experience that we talked about that live in that area, okay? So that's why it's tough, and that's why that number is hard to get to, but trust me when I tell you, you can get there, okay? You just have to be creative, and you have to think of ways that you can get there, and you have to find ways that these companies can contribute to the, to the success of whatever it is that you're buying, whether it's a good or a service to make sure that we can try to be as inclusive as we can with all of those goals that we talked about. So these goals are very important. And as you can see, the ones that we're barely exceeding, these are actually, to me, considering 53% of the population are women, that goal is a pretty low goal. Would you, how many people think that's a low goal? That's a low goal for 50% of the population or more being women. So we should be able to do a lot better than this, not just a little bit better than this. So just keep that in mind. We should be able to be more inclusive and encourage more women to own businesses and encourage them to give it a try and then we can help them. More minorities, more veterans, more disabled veterans, more people living in hub zones. And if we can do that, then we help the whole public policy objective, but more importantly, it gives us a system where people are now proud to be in this system and to work with the federal government because we, we're giving them a chance and they feel better as taxpayers knowing that they're actually using some of that money for themselves, which is always a great thing to do, okay? So let's talk about some policies. The functional management responsibilities of HHS as far as the small business program are delegated to this Office of the Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization Director. You've heard that called the SADBU, right? In addition to that, we have people that are like Anita that are down here. And, uh, Anita, you're a small business specialist, right? And we have the SADBU Director exercises full management, but the small business specialist reviews and makes recommendations for all acquisitions. So remember when Anita said that she wanted to make sure that you included her as part of that acquisition team that we talked about from FAR Part 1? The reason we want to do that is, is because, A, it's something that's being mandated where we're using those as goals for the agency, but more importantly, we have to make sure that if there's a chance for us to set aside work for small business in accordance with the FAR, and in accordance with the HS, HHS, acquisition regulation, then that review must take place prior to issuing the solicitation. So we have to make sure that there's a chance that we can include this. So when we get to this part where we're going to talk about market research here in a few minutes, I want you to make sure that when we do this, one of the things that we always want to consider is how can we include small business and in what it is that we're trying to do, okay? Questions on that? So let's talk about some general kind of acquisition initiatives. So we've talked about a couple of these, but I just want to make sure that you understand. So we've gone through this whole business of working as a team. So all those initials you see there is an integrated product team, an integrated project team, an integrated program team, and an integrated systems team. All of those different initials 
all basically boil down to an acquisition team, which is what that AT is. And that's all in that uh, FAR Part 1 that I read to you. The second thing that we look at is performance-based acquisition. So this is where, for years and years and years, we went out to people with a statement of work, and we would tell them what it is we wanted, and they would give us what it was that we asked for. And so, what is the definition of insanity? Does anybody know that? This is where you are continuing to do the same thing, but you're expecting different results. <laughs> so if you go out with a statement of work, and you continue to ask for the same thing, and then you continue to get the same thing, but you're expecting to get something different, you're going to be in for a shock. You will never get anything different unless you actually allow some flexibility to be built into this entire equation. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to look at what we call performance-based acquisition. So other than the shameless advertising for my company, I'm going to use this cup <laughs> as an example of how we can do things a little bit differently with performance-based acquisition. So when we went out with the statement of work, we went out and said we wanted a ceramic cup. You guys have all seen one of these, right? And it should hold about this much liquid, and you should be able to hold it in my right hand or my left hand. I should be able to put it onto a countertop without it falling over. And it's going to look surprisingly similar to this cup. I go out with a statement of work. What am I going to get? I'm going to get this cup. So since his cup is going to be this cup, and her cup is going to be this cup, and your cup is going to be this cup, the only way that I can discriminate between those vendors that are offering me their cup is price, okay? So now, the only, so if, if she comes in at two, and he comes in at, at uh, 195, and you come in at 190, 190 wins, ding, 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 I'm buying your cup because your price is cheaper, and all of the cups were exactly what I asked for. Okay, so let's flip the script a little bit. Instead of asking for this cup, what I'm gonna ask for is a vessel that can hold at least this much liquid that I can hold in my left hand or my right hand with one hand and that I can put onto a table without it falling over. And if that's all the criteria that I give to a vendor and I send this out in a request for quote or in a request for proposal, the answers that I get can range from, just imagine here, I could get an aluminum cup, and that aluminum cup could keep the liquids hot and cold. I could have a cup that's got a cap on it that I can open that cap and drink, and I can close that cap, and it's done. I could get it with a straw in it so that I can slurp from it, <laughs> or I could push that straw back down inside and it disappears. I could make it so this is made out of plastic so I can run with it. I could make it so that it, you know, you get the idea. What am I getting? Innovation. And if I can get that much innovation with a cup, imagine the innovation that you can get with what it is that you're buying. And so the reason that I shamelessly use this cup for advertising my company is that if we can get that kind of innovation with a cup, when we go to a performance-based acquisition, what we're going to do is allow the vendors to surprise us, and by allowing them to surprise us, we will now get the innovation and price, differenti price differentiation that we need so that we can actually start getting some movement toward and getting things smaller and better and cheaper and faster and all those things that we look for when we're trying to buy things. We do that in our own lives. How many people bought something because it was slower and more expensive? How many people bought something because it was bigger and more expensive? No, no one, people want things that are smaller and faster and cheaper and better and all of those kind of superlatives, right? So just keep all of those things in mind. So uh, that's the initiative that we call performance-based acquisition. So the second part of that statement there, though, is where we're trying to get our small businesses and all businesses, really, to be paid in 15 days. So the Office of Management and Budget and for those of you that are cores, you probably already know this, and if you don't, I'm really, really <laughs> sad to inform you that you don't have 30 days under the Prompt Payment Act anymore. You still have 30 days, but you only get 15 of them, okay? And you as the core really only get seven of them. So the plan right now is that we're going to pay for small businesses. This is what OMB came out with in 2012, is they came out with a policy that said all small businesses need to be paid in 15 days or less, okay? And so what they did is they said the core gets seven days, 
finance gets seven days, and on the 15th day, we're going to cut the check. And the reason for that is, is that small businesses complained to the White House and to the Office of Management and Budget that one of the reasons that they were failing is because they had government contracts, but they couldn't actually get paid in a timely fashion, and it was causing them to have cash flow problems that would actually cause their businesses not to be successful, okay? So fast forward about another year, and in 2014, Office of Management and Budget received a bunch of more complaints. What do you think the second set of complaints were? They were small businesses that didn't, I mean, that were under a large business. They were not getting paid in 15 days like the small businesses that were primes, right? So those large businesses, we had to now start paying them in 15 days. And so in a bunch of agencies, and I don't know what the policy is here within HHS, but in a lot of agencies, what they've said is, is that all invoices should be paid as a goal within 15 days, with seven days for the core, seven days for the PM, I'm mean, not for the PM, but for the finance, and then on the 15th day, finance would actually write the check, okay? So can anyone tell me if that's the policy here at HHS or not? Are you guys using that? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So the next thing down here, and this is about risk. So when we have a fixed price contract, we can use fixed price contracts for a lot of things. If it's something that we've bought and that we feel comfortable and that we think that we have a lot of vendors that feel comfortable using, a fixed price contract, then we're going to push for them to use fixed price contracts because the risk for the government on a fixed price contract is almost zero and the risk for the vendor is 100%. And so vendors are going to build risk into their price, right? They're going to make sure that for that price that they have to deliver within this period of time that we get it to them. So they prefer to use fixed price contracts because if they can do this more efficiently, or more effectively, then they can actually make a little bit more money. And so we encourage them to use it. They like using it. And it's something that is now one of our policies. So we're going to try to use less cost type contracts because on a cost type contract, the goal of the overall contract, to be perfectly honest, is we're going to pay them and they're going to give us their best effort. Okay? And best effort may not be the final answer. Okay? Maybe we continue to spend, they continue to spend. And so at some point we go, okay, no moss <laughs> or whatever. And in some cases we actually get them to deliver what it is that we want. But the bottom line is, is we're sharing the risk. Because a cost type contract, we're sharing risk. Whereas with the fixed price contract, all of the risk is on the vendor. Everybody understand that? Okay. So especially because of the environment that we're in now, one of the things that we're seeing as a overall kind of federal government initiative is that we're trying to get things under contract sooner. Does anybody, you guys got your money just like the rest of us in May? <laughs> you know how the fiscal year starts on October 1st and we get money that's designed to be used, especially o and kind of money, this operations and maintenance kind of money, which I'm sure you guys probably use here as well. And that is only good for one fiscal year. So when you get that money in May, it's not one fiscal year anymore. It's a May to September year that you have to use that, have that money obligated under contract, right? And so one of the things we're trying to do is see if there's some things that we can do that will help us to get contracts out faster, okay? What we did in the agency that I support is we actually worked these contracts based on the president's budget submission all the way up to the point that all we would have had to do was sign it and unless something changed drastically when the actual budget came out then we would when the budget came out we were in position as soon as we got our allocation we could sign it and it'd be out the door so we did that and it worked this year so the goal was is whenever we got our money we were going to be prepared to have our contracts out by june 30th okay so Guess what they did for us this year? Because they're so kind, they gave us the money in May. <laughs> and now we had less than 60 days to get the contracts out. But because we were prepared, I would say we probably got about 95 or 96% of those contracts out in that period of time. Because one of the things that we're concerned about where I am is, is that if we don't get those, get those dollars awarded, 
then someone is going to come back and maybe try to sweep those dollars and use them for some of those unfunded requirements that we talked about because they can't wait until September to find out that they're not going to spend something, right? They have to start identifying that sooner when we're working on a shorter uh, life cycle for these funds, okay? So two-year money turns out to be 18-month money. You get it in three-year money turns out to be two-and-a-half-year money when you get it six months into the year or later. It's, it's just something that we're dealing with at this particular point. As a result of what Congress is doing, there's also some concern that sequestration and some of those kind of things are going to rear their heads again, right? And so getting things under contract as quickly as possible are things that we really need to be concerned with. Okay? Questions? So we need to be sure that we have better oversight and we need to look at contract incentives. And I know a lot of people don't feel comfortable with incentives for contracts, but um, it is something that we have to be concerned about because we want to incentivize that which is important to us, okay? So the example that I used last time, and since for consistency purposes I'll use the same bad example again, is that back in 1989, I was watching a World Series game that was between San Francisco and Oakland. And they were playing the game in San Francisco. And in the middle of the game, as they were showing this thing on national television, they had this big earthquake. And buildings collapsed, and bridges collapsed, and bridges that were double-decker bridges collapsed. But the most important bridge that collapsed was a bridge that went from San Francisco to Oakland. And the reason I, I'm using this as a story is, is because it was in the best interest of the city of San Francisco and the city of Oakland and the state of California and obviously for the federal government to try to get that bridge open again because between those two cities they did a lot of commerce and as long as that bridge was down in order to do commerce they would have to drive all the way down to San Jose and then up to get over to Oakland or they'd have to go across the Golden Gate Bridge and drive down to get to Oakland which was about a four-hour trip. So literally, by the time you got to work, you would have to turn around and start driving home in order to make it home, you know, in time for dinner kind of thing. And so there was very little commerce that was going on between these two cities during the period of time that that bridge was down. So they went out on a contract, and the contract went out to everyone on kind of fed biz ops, but what they found was that all of these construction contractors that, that repaired bridges and, and built bridges teamed together into one big conglomerate kind of business because for the period of time that this bridge was down, it wasn't like they needed to put it up and take it down for rush hour and put it up and take it down for rush hour. They could just work three shifts and get this thing done. So they came in with a bid that said, we can actually do this based on that kind of condition in 90 days, which of course you can't get anything built in 90 days these days, but back then they were going to do this project in 90 days and so the the city of San Francisco and the city of Oakland got together and said, you know, we need to incentivize them to get this done sooner. And so what they came up with is for every day that they got this project done in less than 90 days, they would get $1 million that would go straight to the bottom lines of all those companies that were involved in this procurement, so, which is a pretty good deal, okay? And for those of you that are not in business like I am, a million dollars can go a long way towards solving a lot of ills, okay? And so this was something that the company said, wow, let's see if we can do this. Now, the criteria was is that the bridge had to be more earthquake resistant. It had to be built to all the federal standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't that they could rush this through and do a shabby job. And in fact, the bridge is still completely operational all of these years later, since 1989. So they go to work, they work the three shifts, they get this thing done, and they bring it in 10 days early. So the government has to write them a check for whatever you know, their fees were going to be, plus this additional $10 million check. And so the contractors are doing the happy dance, that they get to share $10 million extra dollars between them. And the government people are doing a happy dance because since they were doing, we'll say, $20 million a day of business, that 10 days early translated into $200 million that they were going to benefit by spending $10 million. So you understand that return on investment? Does that make sense? So we incentivize that which is important. We need to figure out what kind of a return we're going to get on that investment. But one of the things that we have to do is we have to incentivize, in this case, something that was important to us, which is bringing it in a little bit sooner. So as long as we do that, 
then that's why when we say we're going to have better oversight and application of these incentives, that we want to keep that in mind. We want to incentivize that which is important to the government, okay? And then the last thing down here is industry involvement. Throughout the FAR now, and throughout any of these uh, supplemental kind of regulations that people do as supplements to the FAR, what you'll see is, is that we're encouraging a partnership with business. Instead of that old us versus them that we used to have, that old, you know, we're in this to win this kind of thing, and we're in this for them to lose this kind of thing, what we're in is for kind of a win-win. We'd like to see it so that the vendors get their profit and they're allowed to thrive, that we get what we need as far as goods and services, and we're allowed to thrive. And by keeping both sides engaged and having communications throughout this process, we set up some rules for when you can talk and when you can't talk, and we're going to talk through some of those here when we get to market research. But the bottom line is, is we want you as federal employees to feel comfortable when we don't have an RFP on the street to talk to vendors and learn from those vendors and figure out what are some of the best practices, what are some of the things that make it so that they are going to be a viable business for another 10 years. What are they doing that makes it so that when I use their product or service, I feel like I'm getting added value for the money that I'm spending. And so by having those conversations, now when the RFP comes out and we go into a competition, I'm now a smarter consumer. I know better what things to look for. Think to yourself when you went out to buy whatever it was that you bought within the last year, because all of us spent a lot of money in the last year, right? We all spent most of what we made, right? And in the process of doing that, we bought cars, and we bought TVs, and we bought phones, we bought all kinds of things. How many people did market research before they bought any of those things? And the reason that you did market research was because you wanted to make sure that you were getting that best value that we talked about, right? You wanted to make sure that you were getting the biggest bang for the bucks, that your dollars were going to be stretched as far as they could possibly stretch, but more importantly, that you got goods and services that met all of your requirements, okay? And so we do market research for all of those reasons. And so as we go through some of the things we're going to talk about here in a second, is we want to keep in mind that there is a purpose for that, and the purpose for that is, is to make us all into better consumers, okay? So some of the things that we did, not that I did, but that Congress actually did when they were still working back in 1994 and 1996, <laughs> they're still working now. So let me, since this is being recorded, I will say that they work hard and we should be proud of them, okay? Wink, wink. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so we had this FASA, which is this Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act. That is the act that actually made it so that we came up with an acquisition core. And we have a core, a cadre of people, and that's where we came up with the fact P and the fact PM and the fact uh, C and the fact core and all of those kind of things. In the Department of Defense, we called it DEWIA, which was the Defense Acquisition Workforce Improvement Act. All of those are a result of FASA and FAIR, okay? And the reason that we say that is, is because one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to look at procurement policy across the federal government and see if we could come up with something that was consistent, that we had ways that we could certify that people were qualified to be in the business of buying and spending, and that we could also make sure that we had consistency so that when you leave from one agency and go to another agency, that when you tell us that you are of this skill set that we know that you're of that skill set because all the skill sets are basically the same. We all are going to the same standard. We all go into FATAS and do whatever we have to do. DOD has a separate system, but theirs is just as rigorous as yours. In fact, in some cases, a little bit more rigorous because they're buying billions of dollars worth of stuff in a lot of their contracts. So two of the biggest changes were the, the fact that we allowed discretion to the contracting officer in using commercial items. So let's talk about commercial items for one second because this is an important conversation to have. When we're looking for commercial items, there are really three things I want you to keep in mind, and you're welcome to write these down. The first is, is when you use a commercial item, the first thing that you want to decide is, is can I use this item commercial, off the shelf, or non-developmental? Okay, you've heard that called COTS an NDI, okay? So that's the first way I want to look at a commercial item is can I use it as is? The second thing that I want to look at is, is can I use this commercial item if I slightly modify my requirement? 
I'm sorry, if I slightly modify that item. So let's use the case of a Humvee or whatever. Let's use the case of your iPhone. If I can use that iPhone simply by putting in a VPN that will allow you to be able to secure that phone, then I bought a commercial item, I made a modification to that item, and now I can use that item as is, okay? I don't need to paint it, I don't need to do anything else. I'm, all I'm gonna do is make it so that now I've made one slight mod and I can use it kind of as is, okay? And then the third thing that we wanna look at is can we modify our requirement slightly and then use the item, okay? So remember when I was talking about statements of work and statements of objectives and those kind of things? Let's look at those requirements to see if we can modify them just a little instead of being, and keep in mind that a lot of these commercial uh, standards that we have under ISO, under the International Standardization Organization, a lot of those requirements, to be perfectly honest, and IEEE and a lot of those kind of things are now better than a lot of the things we used to have back in the days when we used mill standards and mill specs and some of those things that some of you may be familiar with. All of these commercial standards, in most cases, look at your laptops, they don't break. And when they do break, it's that's because you abused them or whatever. <laughs> at least that's the case with me, but you get the idea. Same thing with your phones, you know, they, they last and last and last. Now the technology may become outdated because that technology is moving at the speed of innovation, right? And so that's something that we can't control, but what we can control is, is by using these commercial standards. Keep those three things in mind. Commercial off the shelf or NDI, slight modification of that equipment or whatever, and then we can use it or a slight modification of our requirement. And so what that does though, is that encourages us when we're using our discretion as a contracting officer to make sure that we're acquiring commercial items and that we're giving a increased attention to market research as we go through this process, okay? And the reason that we want to have that increased focus, yes, sir? So can I get you to go to a microphone? Okay. There, she's got one right here up front if you want to use that, please. I do that because of the people that are on the phone. I'm sorry, sir. In fact, why don't we keep one back there or something with you? If, on if, the uh, second item you mentioned about modifying the item. Okay. Is there a risk there that if you tweak it, the equipment, then you lose the, there's a high risk that uh, you won't receive updates to the item because you've changed it and there's probably some. Right. So that's, uh, that's actually a very good question. And so that was actually one of the reasons that we were stuck with Blackberries for, for so many years. <laughs> is because we weren't actually allowed to make any modifications to most of the phones and Apple, to be perfectly honest, didn't allow anyone to do anything to their phones, as you may recall. And that was part of Steve Jobs' um, plan from day one was is that they would make software and their software would go on their hardware and they didn't release that to anybody. Whereas with Microsoft, they released all of their software to anyone that would pay a license for it, okay? So one of the things that we do whenever we go into one of those situations where we're gonna make a slight modification is we have to work with whoever that contractor is, whoever that corporation is, to figure out if we make this modification with your permission and you've given us the limited rights to make that modification, then we will not invalidate the warranty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that's something we have to work through as part of the negotiation process, okay? Would you like to add anything to that, Walt? Okay. No, you covered it. So, I mean, that's essentially what we're looking for, though, is that if we get, and remember, this is all about rights. They have rights to anything that they paid for. We have rights to anything that we pay for. So a lot of times, if we're paying for something to be developed, then we will own all of the rights to that unlimited. If we are paying for something and we share the development of that with the vendor, then we will share the rights to that, and we will only have you know, shared rights to that. Uh, in the case where they put all of their dollars into something and they've done something, then they will give us limited rights, but those limited rights will only be to do something like I talked about with this IT equipment where we're gonna add some type of a virtual network to it, okay? Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so implicit in these changes is that we use market research to find suitable vendors, including suitable small business vendors, okay? So let's talk about market research. One of the things that you'll find is, is that 
Market research is one of these things that is mandatory. We actually have a FAR part, so a part is a chapter, chapter 10 <laughs> in the FAR. Part 10 of the FAR is market research. And it's only a couple pages, but it is absolutely one of the most powerful chapters in the entire FAR. And the primary reason for that is because the things that we do for market research for the government, a lot of those same things you should be doing for market research for when you get ready to buy something. If you're getting ready to buy a house, you're getting ready to buy a car, a phone, a TV, or whatever it is, because a lot of the things that we do here, we want to do market research. So before developing new requirements documents, that's that sow or that sue that we talked about. If you'll notice that when I talked about it in reference to the performance-based acquisition, I only mentioned the sow for the cup and the sue for that other vehicle that we could use that would be able to hold liquid. There's actually a third one that we call a performance work statement. You guys, do you use performance work statements here? So a performance work statement is kind of on a continuum. A sow over here is very restrictive. We know what we want and we get what we ask for. Over here, we know what the results are that we're looking for, but we're going to give vendors the latitude and the flexibility to surprise us with something that we may not have considered, okay? And then in between, we have this thing that's called a performance work statement, which is a lot like a sow in that we know what we want but it's a lot like a sue in that we want to give them some flexibility, but we want to put it within some constraints. So in the case of that vehicle that we're going to use that could be aluminum or plastic or glass and all those kind of things, the constraint that we're going to put on here is that we want it to fit into the cup holder on my Toyota Camry, <laughs> okay? So by putting that constraint in, that limits kind of the size, it limits the height, it limits a lot of things, and I want it to be able to work in that cup holder, now I put an additional constraint on that I didn't put on the other one because it could be fatter or smaller or quart size or gallon size or whatever. Whereas if it's got to fit in a cup holder, like it's got some other constraints that we're looking for, okay? And that's kind of where when we go out and do this new requirements document, we're talking about the sow and the sue and the PWS that we're going to use to fi figure out what the capability shortfall is that we're trying to address. And that's what market research is designed to do, okay? So we have to do this before we solicit offers with an estimated value in excess of the simplified acquisition threshold. So that simplified acquisition threshold today is $150,000, okay? Now, that changes about every five years or so. It used to be $100,000. You guys may remember that. And I thought it was going to change last October when they changed a bunch of, a bunch of the other thresholds, and it didn't. So the SAT not the scholastic aptitude test, but the simplified acquisition threshold is in fact $150,000, okay? We want to do it before we solicit offers for, uh, I'm sorry, we already did that one, before soliciting offers for acquisitions that could lead to consolidation or bundling, and before awarding a task or delivery order under an IDIQ. You guys are familiar with an indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery contract, okay? And a lot of agencies use those, and they're great contracts. All they mean is basically what we're going to do is we're going to have a competition. We're going to let a contract, but part of that contract is going to be we don't know how many of something we're going to need, and we don't know exactly when we're going to need it. So I'm going to let this contract that gives me some flexibility so that when I do determine those two things, then I can issue a task order to the winning vendors, and that's another little mini competition, okay? So the nice thing about an IDIQ is we had a competition to get down to whoever the remaining standing uh, contractors are. And then once we've selected them and we know that their prices are good, we know that they're responsible, we know that they're responsive, we know that they're capable, we know a lot of things about them, then we have a mini competition just for the task order. And by doing that, we actually get a second competition that brings the prices down a little bit further, okay, and makes them explain a little bit better whatever their technical approach is. And so it's a nice vehicle to use. In addition, we have these things here that are called government-wide acquisition type contracts, and this is where a good example of that would be something like Oasis from uh, GSA. A good example of that would be a lot of other things, and we're going to go through a couple of those explanations here. Uh, but for non-commercial items in excess of the SAT, we want to make sure that we do market research, okay? Any questions on market research?
because we're going to go into some detail of market research. But unfortunately, once again, it's about 1025. You're going to take a break. You're going to come back in at 1035. And we're going to continue this discussion. See you back here at 1035.
going. I mean, uh, okay, so let's go ahead and anyway. start back. <laughs> it's crazy. So when we were speaking before, we were back on this other slide where we went through some of the things that agencies have to do in order to conduct market research. We're going to continue that discussion. This is actually the definition of market research. And Microphone. Mike. Oh. Thank you. Can you hear me? Battery hit. Okay. Hold on. You're good. What changed? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Probably operator. Okay, so this is the definition of market research. Market research is collecting and analyzing information. That's really what we're trying to do. So when we do this, we're actually looking for what are the capabilities. A lot of people don't equate requirements with capabilities, but one of the things that you have to keep in mind that every time we talk about a need or a requirement, what we're really talking about is a capability. And we're looking for a capability shortfall that we need to address by doing market research to see what some of the solutions are to that shortfall. In addition, we do market research so that we can kind of determine what kind of a contract are we going to use? How are we going to involve competition in this equation? How can we make sure that we're looking at the commercial things that we talked about before? How can we look for what are some of the best practices? And so this next part of this discussion is really going to talk to how we can do market research and make it so it's a more effective tool for the ways that we would like for you to appreciate the way that we try to do business. So when we do market research, it's team driven. We've already talked about the fact that we want to get all of those people on there. And you remember back on FAR part one, including what Anita said, we want to get the right people in the room. We want to get legal in there if we need them, technical in there, logistics, procurement, finance. We want to get all of those people in there because every one of them is going to look at this solution from a different perspective. How much does it cost? Is it a solution that's workable? Is it viable? Is it affordable? All of those kind of things. And so when we do this, we want to make it so that it's team driven so that we can look at all of those different issues that everyone's going to bring to that table. And because it changes so rapidly, we have to ensure that the data that you're getting is the most current data. So a lot of times what happens is, is when you get ready to do market research, you go and you find the last market research report that was done and you use that. So I, I like to use the example, of, I told you I'm from Washington State. We only had a couple of car dealers in my hometown. When I would go to buy a car, we would go to the car dealer. I, will have, I would have checked the consumer report from the previous year, <laughs> you know, the car edition from the previous year, which was a year old at that time, and they would tell you kind of what prices to look for. And then if there was something that was a little bit more recent, you may check that, but in those days, we went into these things completely unarmed. So fast forward to about six weeks ago when I bought a car. I actually went out and bought a car. And I did all of the market research, but my market research is going to, be, is going to include a lot of the things we're going to talk about here. I actually went to um, Kelly's Blue Book. I went to Consumer Digest. I went to Edmunds.com. I went to all of these websites without leaving the comfort of my own little home office. But in addition to that, as I was driving down the street and I would see someone park their car and it was a brand new Camry, I would stop and hoping not to appear to be some large, you know, gentleman stalker, <laughs> I would approach them and say, how do you like this car? And what is it that you like about it? And would you buy this car again kind of things, right? And so they would be willing and happy to kind of share that information with me. And so when we do market research, we want to do the same things. We want to make sure that the data is current and that we do this as we move through this whole solicitation and proposal evaluation phase. We have to continue to update this information to make sure that it is the most current. Technology, I told you, is changing at the, at the pace of innovation, okay? And as new things come along, you know, we get a new iPhone and they're already working on the next iPhone. And you get this new whatever and all of a sudden there's a newer one. And, you know, the car that I bought in 2009 didn't have a backup camera. It didn't have uh, the built-in uh, Bluetooth and all those kind of things, right? 
And so these new cars, they have all that stuff. Who knows what we're going to have next? We'll have cover cars or something, so who knows? But the thing is, is when we talk about market research being this collection and analyzing of information, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that the purpose of this is to gather the information about the marketplace. We want to use the industry leaders. Remember I talked about the fact that some of these companies don't stay in business for very long? The ones that do stay in business, we want to approach, and the reason we want to approach them is because they are the industry leaders for a reason. Apple is an industry leader for a reason. Google is an industry leader for a reason. These companies that have been around, and GE, and all of these companies that you go, wow, they've been around as long as I've been around, right? And the reason they're still around is because they continue to be relevant. We want to also not rule out getting things from other government agencies, okay? And the reason that we want to do that is because a lot of times other people may be buying some of the same stuff that you're buying. And by you going to them, what you can get is economy of scale. If you're buying 50 or something and they're buying 500 or something, who thinks that the 50 price and the 500 price are the same? <laughs> they're not. That's the reason we have big box stores where they sell you a whole bunch of bars of soap or a whole bunch of boxes of cornflakes or whatever. Because scale, economy of scale is the way that you can actually get some cost savings, okay? And so if we can take advantage of going to another agency to do that, let's do that. Were you going to say something? Okay. So I like to look at this from this standpoint here. When we do market research, what we're really trying to explore is what is the art of the possible, okay? And the reason I say that is because the fact that we're now doing this performance-based acquisition that I talked about where we're going to try to go out and allow the vendors to surprise us, we will come up with solutions that we never considered. I'm, I'm going to use one military example. I promise to never use another one in here until the next time. But the one example that I like to use is, is that when we were actually going through one of these market research sessions where we were looking for solutions to how to improve the survivability of aircraft. I told you I was a pilot for a while, and so one of the things that we did is we had this Joint Requirements Oversight Council where we brought in people from the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines, and we would all sit in a room. And as we were sitting in the room, we were looking at how can we improve aircraft survivability. And of course, since I was an armor guy, it's like, we need more armor, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Make the skin thicker, you know? <laughs> we can increase survivability by making it so we can survive crashes, you know, and all these kind of things. And so as we went out to industry, one of the industries came back and said, have you considered what would happen if you were to actually make it so that the enemy couldn't actually see you? And we went, well, how would that improve survivability? And they said, well, see, if they can't see you, <laughs> they can't shoot you. You know, and it was like, oh, <laughs> duh, you know? And so that was not something that we considered for aircraft survivability, reduce the radar cross-section. That wasn't in our brains. That was not something we would ever consider. So when you look at the art of the possible, always consider that there are things out there that could be solutions to your problems that you never thought about, but some small business, large business, medium-sized business is working on something that they're looking for an angle to try to get a, a competitive advantage and they'll come to you with an idea and you'll go, you know what, <laughs> duh, uh, yes, that, that would work, okay, just like we did with stealth. And now, you know, we have F-35s and other things like that that are taking advantage of that reduced radar cross-section to be more survivable, okay? So it's one of those things where don't discount anything because everything that you do is really going to have an impact. So market research falls into two phases. You want to talk to this one? Oh, you don't. You'll let me know, right? Okay, so when I look at market research, I look at it as being either tactical or strategic. So when I talk about this art of the possible, I, that's why I want to go out to these uh, lead companies, these best companies that have the best practices, the companies that are making the most money, that have been in existence for the longest period of time, is because they have best practices that they have established. Other agencies have best practices that they've established so that when they go to buy things, we can use some of the things that they've learned. And it's always one of those things that you can start here or you can start here. And given that choice, always choose to start here. It saves you money and it saves you time. If other people have done the homework for you, take advantage of that homework and look at that art of the possible and include them. 
The tactical phase is where we're going to consider all those other things. Did you try using an IDIQ? Did you use a BPA? Did you go out on a BOA? Did you go out on a simplified acquisition? How did you buy whatever it is that you're buying? And what were some of the problems that you ran into that I can learn from, okay? And so that's how we can use market research with other agencies to help us, okay? Questions on that? Okay, so let's talk about kind of the tactical side of the market research. And the first is, is why is it even important? The reason that it's important is because it helps us to become a more educated consumer, okay? When I did the market research for my car that I talked to talk you about, by me being more informed, you know, go back in the time machine to when I was buying a car back 25 or 30 years ago where the dealer would give me the manufacturer's suggested retail price, and I had to believe him because that's all the information I had, right? Now, fast forward another 25 years to where we are today, I walk into that dealership and I am so armed with information that I know exactly the price that I'm going to pay for the car. I don't want them to play games. I will tell them I know how much they're going to make. I, I know the cars that they have in their inventory and what's available. So I know what color, the make, the model, all of the you know, things that are going to be in there and the packages and all that kind of stuff. And before they knew that and they would say, oh, you know, here, let me tell you this. And they were the ones that were the educated consumer and we weren't. Now we can be more educated than they are because all of that information is available. And I'm going to show you some sites that have all that information available. We want to learn about the possible solutions to these problems where we talk about these capability shortfalls that I talked about, right? We want to look at it from the standpoint of capability. We want to learn about problems they had and what they did to mitigate the risk of those problems, okay? So risk, let's talk about risk for one second because that's an important subject as well. The first is, is that when we look at risk, risk has two components, okay? The first component of risk is what is the likelihood or the probability of something happening? And then the second component of this is what is the impact if it happens, okay? So just think of that as what is the likelihood and what are the consequences? So let's use you coming to work this morning. You knew that you had a class at 8.30. Traffic was jacked up on I-70 and, you know, 695 or whatever road that you had to drive in on. And so you knew that to be here early, at least at 8.30, if you come in at 6.30, then you were here two hours early, which was fine. But if you normally come in at 9 o'clock and now you had to be here at 8.30, you had to do something a little bit different to mitigate the risk of not being here on time, okay? So the likelihood of bad traffic is always pretty high, right? But then it's the consequences. If this is just a regular Monday and you were going to be 15 or 20 minutes late, you either call your boss, boss, I'm going to be 15 or 20 minutes late. They say, okay, you come in 15 or 20 minutes late, no big deal. But if I'm the instructor and I have to be up on this stage in front of all you and I'm going to be 15 or 20 minutes late, Walt's got to step in for me like he did a couple weeks ago, right, and, and cover for me until I get there because the traffic was bad. I tried to mitigate and it didn't work, okay? But you get the point. It's the impact. If you have a meeting with your boss or with your boss's boss, that's a pretty big impact. So you're going to do things to make sure that you leave early, you plan ahead, you can mitigate that risk, okay? It's the same thing with these kinds of, of situations that we're talking about in acquisition where we're trying to look at what are the risks what are some of the mitigations for those risks? And more importantly, which risks are acceptable? Which ones are we willing to live with, okay? And so risk can be low, medium, or high. We tend to live with low risk. We tend not to want to live with high risk because high risk things can kill projects and programs. They can make it so that your risk of success or failure really, really go way down, okay? And the reason they go down is because it's high risk. And if they happen, then that's going to affect cost and schedule and performance, which are the kind of the three things that we look for. So when we look at these problems, we want to figure out how can we mitigate those risks. We want to learn about the industry and other agency standards. And the reason that we chose those best companies is because they are the benchmark agencies. They're the benchmark companies. They are the ones that set the standard. A lot of those standards will have people that are sitting from those companies on those standards organizations helping to rewrite what those commercial standards are so that we get to that 99.9999, you know, effort and keep things going. And then we have to learn, back to my whole commercial pitch, we have to learn what can be met using commercial technology, okay? And we talked about the three things that go with that, and I'm sure you all remember those, right? 
Okay. So why is it important continued? Because it permits us to talk about incentives, which we talked about before the break with my 1989 uh, earthquake example, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry for that, and you know, someone used an even older example over here. We want to reduce the risk, and that gets back to those two things, consequences and impact, uh, for both the government and the contractor, because remember what we said, we're trying to make this a win-win. So we want to reduce their risk, because their risk is our risk. If they fail, we fail, and we need to understand that. And the contractors definitely understand that. They don't want to fail. They want to continue to get the business. And so we do things that we don't call incentives, but they really are, because not only are they an incentive, but they're a disincentive, right? So let's talk about a couple of those. The first is, is when we decide that we're going to do a base contract and two, three, or four years of options, would anybody consider that to be an incentive? No one, only one person, two people. Okay, it is an incentive, I'm a vendor, trust me. If I know that I have a chance to have employment for the next five years, and all I gotta do is perform, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna perform, okay? I want that five years worth of business. So even if you're doling it out to me a year at a time because of budget and you know, uh, appropriations and all those kind of rules, the fact that I have five years of available work and that I can get an option exercise at the end of every year as long as I continue to perform and keep you as my customer happy, I'm going to keep you as my customer happy. And you, as long as you continue to give me those options, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you're just as happy as, uh, you know, as can be, okay? And so that's important. And so when we look at that, we want to reduce the risk of doing business for both the government and the contractor. We want to dissect the requirement to remove any unnecessary tasks and unnecessary constraints. We're about the most constraining agency across the federal government that I've ever seen. We put things in there, and here's what happens, to be perfect, Lannis, and we saw this the other day over in DOD. Uh, I was working with a defense contract, and I looked at the contract, and there was a requirement in the contract for a camera-ready copy. Now, unless you happen to be about 10 years older than me, you don't even know what a camera-ready copy is, right? And today, that would be a PDF or a Word document or something else, right? But because we tend to take the last acquisition that we did and dust it off and put it into the new acquisition, and I'm not picking on the 1102s, but there are a lot of people that do that, then we tend to keep some of those old kind of things in there until someone says, what the heck is this? And that was us. We were going, what the heck is this? And it was like, well, I'm not sure exactly what we meant by that, but it was in the last one. And it had been in the last one, and the last one, you get the idea, and just perpetuated to now we were in 2017, and they had something that ceased to exist in 1980 or whatever, okay? Because back in those days, we really did have to lay things out and take a picture of it, and then when it was camera ready, then we would send it to a vendor, and they would make that into a view graph, okay? And that's what they meant by camera ready. It was like, don't we call that PowerPoint now? <laughs> you know, so, but you get the idea. It's one of those things where don't put unnecessary constraints in things because we're too lazy to recognize that we don't need to have them in there. We talked about promoting full and open competition. Let's make sure that that includes small business as well, okay? And that's why we want to have Anita or the Anitas of this world on those teams to make sure that we're including small business as we look at this full and open competition. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back a couple slides, I think it was slide 16, and I missed, I missed adding this. But uh, those of you that do acquisition strategy plans, make sure that you include me or the, the small business, don't put my name in it, the small business specialist as part of the IPT, and I don't know if we call it here integrated project team or program team. I think that's around the beginning of the plan. Also, when it goes down to the market research area, make sure you state in there that you will include the market, the small business specialists in the market research. And then going back to the slide that you were on right now, Tony, um, when it says, um, when he was talking about taking old things and, and co copying and paste to your new document, um, when you're doing your sources sought notices, 
make sure you have the updated information. Don't copy and paste from the last. Number one, things change. I know sometimes people say, well, I did it the last time, Nita. This is the way we did it last time, five years ago. But a lot of policies and regulations change from year to year. So make sure that each time you create those documents, it's a new document and it has the most current information. Okay, thank you. And all of that is absolutely essential. The other thing that's essential is that we actually do planning. So if you go to FAR 7.103, one of the things you'll see there is it talks to the fact that we need to plan in order to be successful. I'm a program manager, so one of my cardinal principles is a failure to plan is a plan to fail, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I don't know how many of you have gone on vacations without planning and start driving toward uh, Florida and say, we're going to stop when we get tired at a hotel, and then you get to a place that you want to stop, and all the hotels are already booked. <laughs> That's because you didn't plan, okay? I tend to overplan, as my wife would say, uh, because I want everything to be successful, and so I probably make it so that it's not successful because I overplan. So somewhere between those two, <laughs> Make sure that you do the planning that's necessary in order to make sure that we're preparing all of the acquisition documents that we need in order to be successful. So who's responsible for doing this? So we've already talked to that. And that's what Anita's talking about, is this acquisition team. And make sure that you add the small business person to this list of all of these people that we want to have as part of this team. They're going to be the ones that are responsible for doing this market research because they all bring something that's a slightly different perspective. And the reason that we always kind of insist that we have competition advocates and small business advocates and legal and some of those people is to protect you, okay? Because if you get far enough along down the pike and you haven't looked at some of these things from the angles that these folks bring, you're going to have to go back and do it again, okay? Let's not go back and do it again. Let's get it right the first time. Each stakeholder is going to have a related but different viewpoint. Uh, the information that's gathered by this team has to be sorted and analyzed and prioritized resulting in a documented report. So one of the things to keep in mind is, is that we don't want to have one agency or contractor's information that is going to be shared with another agency or contractor as long as we're keeping this information. We don't want to attribute any information to one vendor or one agency. What we want at the end of this is a market research report that says we talked to 10 different people and here's what we learned, okay? And the reason we want to do that is because you don't want to give away anyone's competitive advantage. You don't want to give away anyone else's intellectual property. Some of the things they might talk to you about could be proprietary. And we need to make sure that we're not giving up one person's competitive advantage because they will never trust us again. I mean, we're the federal government. We should be able to protect their data and information so that we're not causing them to not be competitive as a result of working with us. And then this report should be appropriate for the size and complexity of the acquisition. I don't want you to spend $150,000 to buy $100,000 worth of goods or services, okay? So when you put this team together, you have to look and say, gee, if I've got this many people that make this much money in this room for this long, it, is that a good return on investment for that time that they spent if what I'm buying is something that's less than it costs to actually bring that team together, okay? So let's keep in mind that we want to have appropriately sized team and based on the complexity of what it is we're buying, and it should include information on both agency and commercial best practices, we want to look at things like quality control issues, and then at the end, we want to get a summary of the ideas and processes that we learned so that we can conclude the market research by walking away with a very good answer to the questions that we're asking. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I want to remind everyone when you're conducting market research, number one, um, if it has not been done in the last 12 years, and it needs to be done again, everything doesn't require 12 months. 12 months. Did I say 12 years? Oh, 12 months. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> it's Monday and I'm still waking up. Sorry. Uh, if it hasn't been done in the past 12 months, it has to be done again. Um, I know sometimes people will say to me, well, every time we do this, we can't find any small businesses that can do this type of work. It doesn't matter 
you still have to conduct the market research again. Uh, sources sought notices is the preferred type of market research for HHS, all of HHS. However, I personally, under, under the SAT, Simplified Acquisition Threshold, I don't feel that's necessary. There's a lot of ways of doing that market research. You can always reach out to me to see what is appropriate. Um, but pretty much, unless there's a similar requirement that had recently had market research, you're gonna have to do that market research if it's 12 months or older. Okay. So let's uh, talk about some techniques that we can use in market research. And just so you know, FAR Part 10 actually lists all of these and I can take you to the FAR Part 10 and you'll see that these are what they list as being some of the techniques that we can use. And so I'm gonna go over these. And I think it is very important for us not to understand that a lot of these things, especially the stuff that I put in bold, are things that we can do in many cases when we're buying something commercially, okay? Or when we're buying something for ourselves. So contacting knowledgeable individuals, remember my conversation of going out and talking to the other Camry owners? <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. They bought a Camry, I'm thinking about buying a Camry. If I talk to them, I can learn something that I didn't know. And it's the same thing here. If there are people out there in government or industry that have some knowledge on what it is that I'm doing, I wanna have them in for a conversation I want to call them, I want to send them an email, I want to use, take advantage of the technology. A lot of people have this whole concept that you have to do something face to face. But face to face in 2017 is not the same as face to face in 1917, okay? In 2017, face to face can be done with Skype. Face to face can be done with FaceTime. Face to face can be done with a lot of different tools that are available out there. If you're allowed to use any of those tools, then that's a good way for you to, to have meetings without having to travel from here to DC or here to California or here to Chicago, you can have the meeting and then when you're done with the meeting, they go back to what they were doing and you go back to what you're doing, okay? So just keep that in mind. Take advantage of the technology that is available as we go through this whole process. We wanna review the results of recent market research for something that was similar. And all that is, it gets back to where if they've done it already, instead of starting down here with a blank page, I start here with whatever they did and to what Anita was saying. Now, I want to see what they did. And now when I publish my market research report, that bar has been raised even to this level. So the next person that comes along is going to start here. Okay? And so it's important for us to document this whole process. And we want to review what has been previously documented so we can make sure that we're taking advantage of other things that have been done in this area. We can publish these RFIs or sources sought, and those are two different things, okay? So a request for information is where we're actually trying to find out about the capabilities of another agency or another company, okay? And what, what we'll do is we'll publish on Federal Business Opportunities page how many people have gone to Fed Biz Ops, okay? So the nice thing about going to Fed Biz Ops is, is that Fed Biz Ops which you go to, which is fbo.gov, okay? For those of you that have not been there, I'll give you a real quick demonstration. But fbo.gov is a very good site to go to because what it does is, is it actually allows you, it actually allows you to go to a website. Well, let me, I'll just go, I'll do Health and Human Services, how's that? So here we go for Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. So when I go to that, I can actually go and look at everything that's come out of this agency, out of Center for Medicaid and Medicare within the last 365 days. Everybody see that? So now when I go down and ask it to search, and we had 40,671, you can see. But when I hit search, what it will do is it will come up with only the ones for the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, of which there are only 40 in the last year. And we can see that some are fair opportunity limited resources, some are actual solicitations, some are combined synopsis, some are awards, you get the idea. So all of those different things that, that are out there, I can go here and I can open this up. Let's say that I opened up one of these pre-solicitations. That could be something like a, a source of salt or, a, or a, in fact, here is a source of salt that uh, Anita was talking about. 
So if we actually go to that particular source of salt, we'll see exactly what it is. They give you the background. They tell you what they seek to acquire, developing, implementing, and maintaining the cost report, risk assessment process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the goal is to have a contractor that will, and they go through all of the things they want for this source of salt. So these are nice. The nice thing, the reason I'm showing you this is that when it's time for you to participate in putting together a source of salt, use this. <laughs> this is something that passed through all of the contracting officers and legal and everything else and got published on FedBizOps by your agency. So don't be afraid to use that, okay? And that's the reason I show these is that it's, you say, oh, I got, it. I got to this in front of a thousand people in, uh, in the middle of a class, okay? So it's really not that hard to do. Yes, ma'am. I highly recommend when people are developing their draft sources sought that they go through me if they haven't gone through me in the past because sometimes when people have posted sources sought notices on FedBizOps uh, without going through me, I find things that might be restrictive, I find things that um, it appears that you're looking for a proposal but you say you're not going to, so to avoid having to do a source of sought notice a second time, I highly recommend going through me at least initially till you see what I'm looking for or you can ask me for samples. Okay. So that's item three there is the RFI or source of salt. The fourth one here is the query in the government-wide database of contracts and other procurement instruments. So remember I talked about this uh, PPIRS, this Past Performance Information Retrieval System, that's one of those databases where we can get a three-year look back at their past performance. We have another thing that contracting officers can go into and contracting specialists that you can get them to look for you. And in that, it's called FPDS, which is the Federal Procurement Data System, and it lists all of the contracts that people have let, how much they were let for, what their subject matter was, et cetera, who won the contract, and all those kind of things. So it's always a good tool to use. Participating in interactive online communications. That's another way that you can do this. This is actually designed more for the, for the later generations, we'll call it. <laughs> so one of the things I, I like about this whole tool is, is that they have now put things like bulletin boards out there on FedBizOps in some cases where you can go and post ideas. And by allowing people to have conversations around those ideas, it gives you some ideas that you may not have considered. Now we've done this on a couple of different market research uh, engagements with Homeland Security where I work now. And I have to say that it's a little bit more time uh, consuming than what I usually like to do for market research because you've got to sort through a lot of kind of chaff to get to the wheat kind of thing, right? But more importantly, what you get is, is ideas from people that are not your usual standard people that respond to a Fed biz ops type uh, request. And the nice thing about it is, is it doesn't have to be a company. It could be an engineer within a company. It could be some scientist from Germany. It could be some, you know, engineer from Sri Lanka. Anyone that's got access to FedBizOps is allowed to participate in that discussion and give you some ideas on things that you may want to consider as a capability solution. We can get source lists of similar items from other contracting activities or agencies, and that just means going to that FedBizOps and instead of just looking for what's under CMS or HHS, go to FedBizOps and see what's available out there on the subject that you're looking for. Put into the search whatever it is that you're looking for to see who else might be doing something along those lines. And you see how quickly that search tool works. It is really good. It is very uh, responsive and it's sensitive to the point that you can put some different indicators in there and get exactly what you're looking for. Review and catalogs and other generally available product literature. That's kind of an important one as well. So we want to make sure that when we go through and start reviewing uh, what's available out there, we go to all of the sources, all of the usual suspect sources that we have. But add to that list of usual suspect sources things like the uh, organizations the, that the manufacturers have, the literature that comes out from the associations, all of those kind of things, we want to make sure that you include everybody and every possible response as you go through this search because we want you to be educated consumers. Conducting interchange meetings. So let's talk about that for just a second because there are a lot of people that get a little confused. How many of you know what the difference is between a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the vendor 
and an industry day. One or two of you, four of you. Okay, so let's talk about it because I think it's an important subject to have. So an industry day is very similar to what we're doing now. Pretend I'm the government and that you're industry. I am telling you kind of what it is that I'm thinking as a government person and you're listening and you're taking notes because you want to learn what the government is thinking, okay? Now, how many of you, since you're all industry, are going to share anything in this forum? And the answer is none of you. You know why? Because you'd be giving away your competitive advantage. You'd be giving away your intellectual property. You would be giving away that which makes you competitive, right? And so when we have an industry day, the government imparts knowledge, but we don't learn a whole lot, okay? They may try to clarify what's the dates and when is the RP coming out or you know, something that's kind of innocuous, but you're never going to learn much at an industry day. They're going to learn because you're telling them what the government is thinking. So they're going to learn a lot about what you're thinking, but you're not going to learn anything about what they're thinking because they're going to be completely, you know, everything close to the, to the vest. Um, and then we have these one-on-one -on -one meetings. Now, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, that's a totally different thing. And the reason it's a different thing is because now it's the government and one vendor in a room. They're in a room with the acquisition team, and they're going to share with us their best practices, what they consider to be something that would be a great incentive or whatever it is that we want to talk to them about. And one of the things I like to do with those meetings, though, is I like to set up an agenda, <laughs> because when you have a meeting, shouldn't you have an agenda? I like to make it so that they have a time limit. I like to limit them to any kind of business development activities that they're going to try to have, because they've got this captive government audience for whatever the time period is that we give them, so they're going to do some marketing. You know that's going to happen. So what I usually do is if I'm going to meet with them for an hour, I'll give you kind of a breakdown here in a couple minutes. But I usually say, let's take 10 minutes for you to do your BD thing, your business development thing, and then from that point on, I want you to focus on letting me learn what it is that I came here to learn from you, okay? And what you came here to teach me or to tell me, okay? And so by doing that, you're allowing them to get that business development thing out with their, you know, <laughs> right? And, and you're also going to, in that hour, learn the things that you need to learn when you hold this one-on-one -on -one interchange meeting, okay? So these have to be held pre-solicitation because once uh, RFP is out, and this is part of that whole we're trying to be as open as we can be, once that RFP is out, everything that we learn from one vendor, any question that we answer for one vendor, we have to publish on FedBizOps, to all vendors, period. So after the RFP, after the request for a proposal, request for quote or whatever goes out, communications then have to be with everybody. We can't have an individual conversation with one vendor and keep it close to our vest and they keep it close to their vest because at that point, the gig's up, we have to communicate with everybody because we wanna be fair and we don't wanna give anyone an advantage over anyone else. So if we talk to one, we talk to all, okay? Questions on any of these things that we want to do as far as techniques for conducting market research. So what are some of the online resources that we have for doing that? So I told you that one of those is that FPDS, that Federal Procurement Data System. So that is the actual website, that top line there. We have GSA's System for Award Management. For those of you that are old school that remember CCR, which was the contractor registry or whatever, yeah, that's no more. So if you go looking for CCR.gov, you're going to find that that is no more. And now what we use is SAM, which is the System for Acquisition Management. And that's where all of the vendors have to register if they want to do business with the government. And when they register there, that will include for them their DUNS number, which we can see if they're a viable company, their CAGE code, which shows that they've been registered and can do business with us, okay? And then the last thing down here is this dynamic small business search, which is a, a way that we can do these things. So we put a little note down here saying that a source of SALT is a government research tool to determine if there are at least enough businesses out there that we're going to get competition. That's why we do source of SALT. The government is required to set aside a certain percentage of their procurements to small business. We talked about that. 
And here, Anita said it was 16% as the goal for overall small business. Uh, and across the federal government, the number is actually 23%, okay? Um, and so there are different ways that people get to those numbers, but one of the ways they can do that is a set-aside. A set-aside actually has a very specific meaning. So when we say that something is set aside for a small business, what that means is, is that that small business, whether it's woman-owned or 8A or hub-zoned or veteran-owned, has to do 51% of the work because it's a set-aside. And when we set aside business, that small business has to do 51% of the work. They can then subcontract 49% of the work to a large business or to another small business or to whoever, okay? So set aside has a very specific meaning. If we have a small business project that we don't set aside, we don't say it's specifically a set aside and we're giving business to a small business, but it's not a set aside and they can compete across all of the different categories of small business, if they only do 10% of the work and subcontract 90%, that's actually okay. So just understand that. The only way that we can ensure that that small business is doing the percentage of the work that we want them to do, and the HUBZone already told you that number is a little bit smaller in that 33 or 35% of the workforce for that hub zone has to be from that hub zone area. But for all of the rest of those companies, of their workforce, they have to be doing 51% of the work for that contract. Any questions on that? Yes, can I get you to go to a microphone? I have a question. Can I get hers you, first since I went to her first? Sorry. I just wanted you to repeat the example you gave with the 10% um, and the 90%. With the 10% of? Um, when you were talking about if it wasn't set aside? Oh, so what happens if a contract is not set aside for, we don't use those words set aside for small business. It's a full and open competition, but only for small business, we'll say. Then in that case, we haven't set aside work for the small business, but we want to have this only for small businesses, but it's not called a set aside because that's very specific and particular language. Then if that small business is doing 10% or even 5% of the work in some cases, then that is still considered okay because we haven't delegated a certain percentage of that work that has to be done by that small business. And we see that a lot, okay? Um, I know that we've worked with some small businesses where they only had the capacity to do 10 or 15% of something, but we try to do a mentor-protege thing. So what we try to do is make it so that over a course of a year or six months or nine months or whatever, we give them more of the work share. So they start with 10 and as they bring people on and they get badged and they're you know, capable and they make sure that they have the skill sets that we need, then they pick up 20%, 30%, 40%. And then when they get to 50 or 51% of it, then we're actually a, a viable kind of what I consider to be a small business relationship. Okay, this lady back here was next, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so um, my question is, should there be a certain amount of time that you allow for them to achieve that 51 percent? So there are, there are some rules on what that time is. I don't know what those are. I'm sorry. I can have someone look those up. That someone happens to be my cohort in crime over here. <laughs> but uh, when we get the answer, which may be after lunch, we'll, we'll come back and let you know. Okay. But there is a time period that they do have to get to 51 percent. It's not immediate. Although in some cases, contracting officers do hold them to kind of immediate, okay? So they have that, that capability. Yes, ma'am. I don't want people to be confused. Here we have either the unrestricted procurements or we have set-asides. So when it's unrestricted, larges and smalls can compete for it. Now, as far as the 51% rule, you need to talk to your uh, contracting officer about those because it's the total cost of the contract well, now, the total 51% value. total value of the contract? Mm -hmm. Total cost of labor? I thought that changed. Okay, so. What, what did you say it was, I'm sorry, so it's the total cost of labor is the 51%? Okay. Can I get you to go to a microphone? Mm -hmm. 
Now, I want to make sure we get this right because you know, I'm not a, a contracting officer, but I play one on TV. I always thought it was 51% of labor. We need to check the FAR because I think that changed the total, 51% total cost of your contract, total value, but I'm not sure. So we'll check it. But I, I don't want people to be confused. It's either unrestricted or it's set aside. There are mentor-protege agreements and joint ventures. And some agencies have give credit to mentor-protege agreements. Here at HHS, we do not have a current mentor-protege program. So that's usually done through SBA. And then th they may form a joint venture to come after a particular procurement and their partners may in that joint venture may be a large business and then SBA has those rules for those joint ventures and the joint venture has to be approved before award of a contract by SBA. So we're going to get some clarification on the 51 percent which I think is a good idea so I see that my cohort is working furiously over there but we'll have this for you after lunch. Let's talk about some other market research resources though. Uh, if you've bid for things like this before, then you got your former bidders list. You have your current awardees, which is also a good source. You saw when we went to FedBizOps that they actually have to post awards on FedBizOps. So you can actually see who won. You can see exactly what the price was that they won for whatever that was. And when it was awarded and what the period of performance of the contract is. So you can see if, for me as a vendor, I can go there and see when that opportunity is going to come up again as a potential for me to bid, okay? And I know what the winning bid was this time, so I know in many cases I'm going to have to get under that. So it gives a lot of information that people can use for uh, trying to, if, whether you're a vendor or the government, as far as doing market research and developing independent government cost estimates and those kind of things, okay? It's helpful to review these historical files for similar acquisitions. I've already talked about that. You want to contact these small business professionals, such as these PCRs and business opportunity specialists and small business specialists within, and in some cases, that you may know from other assignments that you had. Just don't be afraid to contact people to get information because these folks are a, a resource that you should not ignore. And it can be very, very helpful in making sure that you help the agency to meet some of those goals. I know that uh, GSA kind of ruined it for the rest of us for going to industry conferences. <laughs> but, but I do want you to keep in mind that that window is opening again and that more people are attending these conferences and exhibitions and, and uh, all of those kind of things so that you can use those as a way for you to learn. And when I've gone to industry conferences, both as a government person and as an industry person, I learn a certain amount by the people that are presenting the papers and all of the technical, you know, panels and all that kind of thing. But I learn probably even more sometimes at lunch and at the happy hour afterwards. And I mean, I remember it, <laughs> but, but you do learn a lot by going to these things. And it's, it's just a resource that you want to take advantage of. Um, use this business development program that we talked about for the eight days. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But especially if you're going to be using a small business set aside, because they are basically in a position where they can market, we can market with them, we can help them to develop their capabilities and skill sets, we can make sure that we're increasing their probability of success, okay? So that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to make it so that we get more vendors that are more capable, that are providing us with things that help us to further our mission, and that make us into better consumers. And then the last thing on this slide is, is that you want to look at the SBA district office and the business opportunity specialist because they can be another good resource for identifying capable program particulars that you may be looking for. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the FAR under the, the limitations on subcontracting, clause 52.219-14, under services except construction, at least 50% of the cost of contract performance incurred for personnel, Chuck, you're right, shall be expended for employees of the concern. So that would be 50% of the labor. Okay. Yes, sir. 
So can I get you to go to a microphone, please? Sorry to keep saying that, but there are people that are online and they can't pick it up. And having been one of those people, I always go, I wonder what question that was. Since you have right? the answer now of the mm -hmm. official, yeah, whatever we were discussing, I kind of lost track of the actual reason for the answer of what 50% like a certain contract or is it the set aside business or is it how you write your, uh, not your statement of work, but your, like when you award, you have to find a business that has that. Can you restate that answer and where it applies to your, I kind of lost that. So did you stand up so you can answer this, Walt, or did you stand up so that she can give the answer to it? Or would you like me to give the answer to it? Why don't we let you give the answer to it? Oh, brother. I'm looking at the whole clause. This is for small business set -asides. This is for this is For the full reading, Federal Acquisition Regulations Clause 52, TAC 219, that's Army, dash 14, limitation of subcontract. Here are the key requirements. Services except construction. At least 50% of the cost of contract performance incurred for personnel. Which is labor. Shall be expended for employees of that concern. For supplies, the concern shall perform work for at least 50% of the cost of manufacturing the supplies, not including the cost of materials. And then there's general construction and others. But that, that clause is in there to let the contractors know, here are your limitations. You have to perform this much, subcontractors perform that much. So to get back to your question, sir, what we're talking about is, is when you're doing market research and we want you to include a small business and you're trying to determine when you bring these folks in, how are they going to meet some of these small business requirements? If they could meet them by going full and open and you having a certain percentage of that set aside, that's one way that you could go out with that acquisition. But the reason that we do market research, remember I said strategic and tactical. The strategic, we're trying to figure out the order of the possible. The tactical, we're trying to figure out what kind of a vehicle, what kind of competition. Is it going to be full and open? Is it going to be an IDIQ or whatever? Are we going to use an agency-wide contract or a government-wide contract? All of those questions can be answered during market research. And once we narrow it down that we're going to get our small business by doing something, then we need to understand what that something is. And that's what we're talking about here is if it's, uh, as she says, a full and open kind of un unrestricted competition where anyone could win, including a small business, then what we may do is say whoever wins, if it's a large business, they have to set aside 23% of that work for a small business. And in some cases, we may actually stipulate that if a small business wins, that they have to do 23% of that work. But if we say it's a small business set aside, then we will specifically say 51% or more than 50%, as that says, has to be done by that small business. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. And the purpose of that is to... So, yeah, so what he's saying is that it's really advantageous for a small business to, for us as the government to designate something as a set-aside. It really does put the pressure and say, we want small business, we made it higher pressure, pressure, pressure. So it's not 24 percent, it's 50 percent. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, the reason the limitation of subcontracting clause is there for small business set-asides is to stop pass-throughs. So a company's fronting it like it's, they're doing all the work, but they're really passing it to a large business. And that does happen, and that's why that clause is there. Okay. So all great discussion. And, uh, and that's really what I was trying to, to generate by making these slides vague. No, I wasn't really. But, but you get the idea. I, I enjoyed the fact that I told you that we were going to learn from each other. So let's talk about some things that we can do that are kind of do's and don'ts. So the first thing, going back to what I talked about with this one-on-one -on -one session that we're going to have with these vendors, if you allow that to become a marketing opportunity for, for the vendor, they will take the full time that you set aside and use that for marketing or for business development. So just make sure 
that when you set the schedule up that you actually set aside a very, very brief period of time for them. Let me go forward a couple slides and I'll come back to this one. So this is slide number 26. So this is what I like to do for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I like to set it up so that we have an agenda that says here are the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to set aside an hour for you to come in and talk to us, but I only want you to spend 10 minutes telling me about the capabilities of your agency or your company. And then we're going to go through some introductions, kind of like what we did this morning. But then I want you to be able to talk to me about what you consider to be best practices. What are some performance measures and metrics that I can put into my SUE or into my QASP, the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan? You guys are familiar with that? So a Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan is a way that the government sets up and assures themselves that the quality that we talked about way back earlier this morning is what we're getting. And so we don't have the ability to check 100% of everything, but what we do is we have the ability to check enough that we feel comfortable that what we're getting is a quality product or service. And so we set up a QASP so that we can do that. And it's just like when I had my production line out with my company when I was working for the major defense contractor, the government PM or core would come in and they would take one item off of my production line and go put it into a Humvee and if it worked, they assumed that everything worked. And if it didn't work, they had to assume that nothing worked. And so it was all or nothing <laughs> with them. And it was kind of scary for, for a vendor, but that meant that I had to make sure that everything worked every time because when we gave it to a soldier and they're over on that you know, two-way range, <laughs> Uh, we want to make sure that it worked for them, okay? So that's one of the things we do. I want to talk about any technical issues they had. Also up here, I also like for the vendors to tell me what they would consider to be something that would incentivize them to give me more than what I'm asking for, okay? So that's something that we look for as well. And then finally, in the last 10 minutes, I usually set it up so that we can have questions we can wrap this thing up so that at 59 minutes I'm standing up <laughs> and I'm walking them to the door. And what that does for me is it allows me to kind of control this hour. The government is in charge. We do it at our facility. You know, we try to do some things that make sense. Does that make sense? Any questions kind of on this? And it doesn't have to be an hour. Some people do it for longer. Some do it for shorter. I've seen it for 45 minutes or whatever. But you want to make sure that every vendor gets the same hour to do this, okay? So if you're going to do this for five people, five vendors, or five agencies that you're bringing in, give them the period of time, let them know exactly what your expectations are, give them this agenda in advance so that I've had people that have walked into these sessions and they have the answers already typed out. So that if for whatever reason we don't get to all of the questions, you know, we, didn't, we don't make it down to the technical issues or whatever, then they will have the responses that they plan to tell me about written out so that they can hand me that when they leave at the end of an hour. Does that make sense? So anyway, that's just something that I try to do and it's just something for you to keep in mind as a way that you can do this so that it actually makes sense. So don't let this turn into a marketing opportunity. Make sure that it's meeting all of the requirements that you think would be necessary for you. Second, clearly state that the purpose of this session is market research. Vendors hear <laughs> and react to everything as if they're going to get a contract out of this. So you want to make it clear. There will be no contracts that will result from you being here. Now, what the vendor hears is, is, is that I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one audience with the government. I'm going to be able to shape this procurement so that I have a competitive advantage, which is fine. I don't mind that. I'm a vendor. Trust me, I would do the same thing. But what you want to do is make sure that you as the government are controlling this conversation. Third, let them know what it is that you are expecting as an outcome from this meeting. So if it's those things that I listed on that previous slide, that I want to know about incentives and best practices and what made you a benchmark company and what can I expect, what were problems that you had and how did you solve them, what kind of prices did you come to, whatever it is, clearly state that so that when they come in, they're prepared to answer your questions. This is not a game of gotcha <laughs> where they, they come in for market research and you tell them, here's the questions I have once they get there. 
give it to them in advance, give them a chance to prepare responses, and then they'll be better prepared to respond to you. Make sure that you invite the right people. There's nothing I hate worse than when everybody on the team introduces themselves and everyone on the team is a business development person. I get a little suspicious as to how they're going to address my technical issues or my best practices or production issues or whatever it is that I have questions on if they're all a bunch of BD people. So tell them in advance. I also like to restrict the number of people that are coming in, by the way, because I've worked with some companies. Uh, they shall remain uh, nameless, but just understand that they're large like defense contractors. And they would send me this list of people that they plan to bring, and it would have like 15 names on it. And I would say, okay, so here's the rules that we're going to now have to establish. Every vendor that's coming in to help us with market research is restricted to five people, of which only one can be a business development person, period. And you can do that. You can tell them, you know, what the team can consist of that's coming in to talk to you. So if they come in with three, they can still have one. If they come in with two, they can still have one. But the bottom line is, is that you really want the people there that can answer the questions. Um, and then make sure that you have an agenda. If you don't have an agenda, there's no way that this meeting is going to happen. You notice I started the morning off telling you, here's what you could expect. If you guys get bored back there, you can kind of see where we are on that list and go, oh, God, we only got another, you know, 14 items left on this list or whatever. It's the same thing. We want them to prepare in advance. We want you to prepare a list of technical questions if that's appropriate. Don't direct those questions to one solution. So we're here to learn. And once again, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> we don't want to be defined as insane. What we'd like is for them to give us some solutions that we had not previously thought about. So let's have that conversation. You want to let them know if the session is going to be recorded? I put that in there, but let me tell you a secret. When I say record, I don't mean that you have a tape recorder and that you're recording the session. What I mean is, is that someone's taking notes and that those notes are going to be published, but they're not going to be published that indicate what we learned from them. Those notes are going to be compiled and we're going to tell you what we learned from all of the vendors that we talked to. So we're never going to attribute anything we learned to that one vendor. Because I don't think under any circumstances should you be recording an, a one-on-one -on -one session with the vendor because if someone FOIAs that, then you got to fight it for proprietary reasons and all those kind of things, and that becomes a legal battle that you don't want to address, okay? Uh, if they're going to talk about proprietary things, make sure that whatever they give you, that you secure and that you put it into a storage container or something that makes sure that you don't get one vendor's you know, there's nothing worse than having three or four of these in a row and you receive these brochures or whatever with proprietary information from one vendor and now this next vendor comes in and there you have it laying on the table and you all went to go get a cup of coffee and the vendor's sitting there going, gee, so I look at this, competitor's stuff, and don't even tempt them with that, okay? Yes. Can I answer a question someone asked back here about how long does it take a contractor to reach it take a size? More than five thing? minutes? No, no, no. Okay. That's why I wanted to jump it in here. Can okay. I? Go is ahead. that okay? Yes, Can sir. I? Okay. Um, when a contractor submits a supposed proposal, there are certifications and representations as part of that proposal, and a contractor certifies they are or are not a small business concern. Now, a company can self-certify, or they go through SBA and they get certified as a small business. If I, as a contracting officer, look them up, I can see whether they are certified by SBA or they're not certified. If they self-certify, can still accept that, however, subject to protests, because when you synopsize that and somebody sees, well, I'm making an award to somebody who self-certified they're a small business, you're liable to get protests on size standard, so you run a risk if you're going to accept that as self-certification. That's something contracting officers want to look into before they go and do it. As far as a time limit, they can't submit a proposal and say, well, we'll be certified in 20 days because it says in the certs and reps, not I will be or I may be, but I am or I am not a small business. So they have to certify that on the on their okay. proposal. So. Sounds good. And it's the same thing that we were talking about before with the veteran-owned businesses, that if you go to the v Veterans Affairs list, then you can see who's on that list still, because people are on that list, 
and they graduate. <laughs> but they don't tell you that they graduated. They just tell you that they were on the list, right? And now they're no longer on that list. And so in some cases, and that's kind of what he's alluding to, is just make sure that they are and not that they used to be or that they will be, okay? But most importantly, just make sure that we're not sharing one company's solution and be careful with this whole intellectual property thing. And then lastly, we want to conduct market research. I like to do it at the government's location or at a neutral location. And then what that, the reason I do that is, is because if you do it at their location, how do you know that they're not recording this and that you're going to be held to something that you may have said? You know, so you want to make sure that that's not the case by you being in control of that location. Either it's a neutral or it's at the government, and that way we can kind of control who is doing what, and that's important because we don't want to put ourselves at risk either. Now this last, or the next to the last one here is one of my own pet peeves because this is 2017 and I know we use email for a lot of things. So when someone has left their business in California and gotten on an airplane and flown coast to coast to come here and visit you in beautiful Baltimore and they had to spend the night because your meeting was at nine o'clock and they have the meeting, they're gonna have lunch and then they're gonna get on a plane and fly back to California that's a pretty big commitment for you to then send them a thank you note via email that says thanks for coming. So what I like to do, and it's probably because I'm an old school guy, I like to actually take my stationery or whatever I have for my agency, put a thank you note on there that says thank you for taking time. I know that you have a lot of different things that you could have been doing. You came to visit us and to educate us and we really appreciate that and sign it. My name, my title, and put it in an envelope and actually send it to them. Now, fast forward back or go backwards in time to when I was actually in the government, I actually went to visit a vendor about maybe three years after I left the Pentagon, and on the wall behind his desk was one of those thank you notes that I had sent for someone coming in to do market research with me when I was in the Pentagon. That's how important it was for them and it took me three minutes and a you know, 14 cent stamp or whatever it was at that time to actually send it to him, okay? And speaking of 14 cent stamps, it's about time for stamping a lunch hour on us. So it's about a quarter till by this clock. We're gonna come back in at one o'clock by this clock. In an hour and 15 minutes, we're gonna start again, okay? I'll see you at one o'clock. <laughs>